What's up, everyone? Welcome to another episode of Between Two Heads. My name is Jamerson Wellborn. As always, I'm joined by my co-host, Addison DeMora. And here, we're with somebody who needs no introduction. Um, Kev, welcome to the show, man. It's an honor to have you on. Man, thank you so much for having me on. It's a pleasure. Uh, this is going to be a fun one. Bro, I, we're, we're about to take a deep dive. And I've had the pleasure of, you know, hanging out with you on more than one occasion. We've been able to chop it up. And I've gotten to learn a ton about you. And I think that you know, before we get into all the cool stuff you're doing with the Gangier and the work with Cookies and, and all those other really cool projects that I want to touch on, I want to take it back. I think a lot of people who know you know you for your work in the last 10 to 15 years, and they don't really know your backstory. And, you know, we're all about sharing the stories of, of these culturally relevant people to our community. And so um, what, I know you grew up in Rhode Island. Why don't you tell me a little bit about what childhood was like, man? Oh, totally, totally. We were, we were just chopping it up before the, you know, the camera kicked on. And we were talking about, like, in order, to, I think in order to understand, like, me as a person, you got to understand the the background that kind of launched me and a lot of people my age from, from different areas in America, that we were all born to the, the people who had been uh, raised and gone through the glory years of the 50s. So if you were white American and you had gone through the 50s, you went through this period of time where you could basically succeed with the job and it was so unbelievably unique that it tainted the mind of those people forever to this day they still believe you can work yourself through any problem because at that time period you could you could get a job at 14 you could you could you could pay 10 cents for a cup of coffee like it was an unbelievable time period and so that group bore us as children right so i'll be like i said i'll be 56 this summer but the thing is, is that when we go into the world as kids, what we see is a different world. We see where the economy has changed and all the jobs, the blue collar industry, the craft, the trade, all got exported out to different countries so that they could make better corporate profits, right? So New England takes the fucking first. The, the parallel would be Detroit. So if you get a chance to go take a trucking trip to Michigan, and take a look at Detroit, what you saw is the same thing. Detroit was was stripped of its uh, opportunities to succeed and then abandoned. And so New England <laughs> was stripped of its opportunities to succeed in a lot of ways and abandoned. But what made you New England unique is that New England's got a crime network that's supernatural. And so the mob owned New England since New England was New England. And what happened was you started having this cultural merging where the people that were in the fisheries, fisheries were devastated, factories, factories devastated, machinists, uh, heavy equipment operators. All of a sudden, everybody said, listen, I need to survive and exist. And you started having a cultural acceptance of crime where criminal shit was okay. And, and I was about to tell you about, I was, I was trying to explain to someone the significance of okay was I was like 13, maybe 14 going on a date. And as I was coming out of my grandfather's house, he yells to me the size snow tire that fits on his car. And my girl says to me, I didn't know you sold tires. And I said, I don't. I said, that means tonight when I drop you off, I'm going to go shopping for those fucking things. And I'm going to go steal a set and bring them home to him. And she was in fucking horror because that was not from her, you know, from her pocketed world. But for us that had been kind of like swept into that, it was the norm. And so my father had been raised in the depression and with, to a single mom and he was a fucking hustler. So he came up rough. And my my cousin had uh, uh, was another rough cat, but my cousin was organized crime. So I was exposed to like really high level organized crime on a family level where, you know, you would go to visit your cousin at the house next door and all these people would be visiting and barbecuing and you'd be talking to him and meeting him. But literally, they were like the underworld heads of the syndicate. And so it normalized criminal activity. And it also allowed me to be able to see that side of the world from a different perspective because I was looking at it from cats that were hustlers. So like when you were a kid in that situation, I remember I was like six, maybe five or six tops. And I was with my father and I watched him pull a score. Right. And when we got home. I told my mother and said, mom, because you know, I'm learning not to steal. Right. And I'm like, mom, I saw dad pull a score. And so I hear her. She, so she starts laughing and she walks in the other room and she starts busting his balls. What the fuck? Your fucking kids seeing you pull a score. And so he says something and 
maybe like 30 minutes later, he calls me and he goes, hey, come outside. And we walk outside and I get punched right in the fucking mouth. And I mean fucking dropped. And I'm laying there in the fucking dirt and I get the fucking lesson, never be a fucking rat. And so, you know, when you when you come from that type of background, it it, it, it changes how you see the world. And when you're around crime that's not um, random and it's successful and the people that are doing it are also successful in other aspects of your life, you can kind of see how all these different facets of the world merge and how how opportunity exists for everyone to some degree. But for those that are less fortunate, crime is the door into the money. Yep. And so once once the money is removed from an area, crime becomes pretty acceptable. And New England was just the fucking criminal hotspot that was that was ripping. And oh, so yeah. we're all Irish. Right. So the, the Italians run the mob, but the Irish are the ones that run the fucking beatings. And you you basically grow up in a neighborhood and everyone's aspiration is to somehow end up in organized crime because that's the most successful job you could have. But the thing was that, like, for me, my cousin was so was so fucking giant that when he got in trouble, he caught a 200 year sentence. And so I used to go visit him in prison and, uh, you know, take his mom to visit him. So for me, you know, when you are when you're looking at the ramifications of like what big shit really does and you see what, you know, a 200 like when you go visit your cousin and you know that he's going to die in that fucking place. It starts to really. uh you know, change your perspective on stuff. You become like a lot more cognizant of cause and effect. But the fact was that there was little opportunity. And so I was working for my old man's construction company. And I had, uh, I, I was fortunate that my mom was a, a brilliant scientist. So like when I, my mom, when I was a kid was a research geneticist. And so I grew up in a house with my mother doing fruit fly fucking breeding experiments. And so to me, that's why I never said I was a breeder, even though I've been like working with cannabis genes for decades and I'm involved in a shitload of projects forever. To me, a breeder has a very specific ability to reproduce consistent, reliable results at a, at a statistically significant level. And so if you're not able to fucking satisfy that criteria, then really you're a seed producer, which is cool too, because that's what I am. I'm a seed producer. I work with breeders. But breeders are real specific. And so I got that good science background from my mom. And my pops was a, a fucking master thief hustler, but he was a phenomenally talented uh, builder, developer, heavy equipment operator. So I grew up on a construction site. Uh, I had I had a tractor trailer truck license by the time I was 18. I could weld all positions, all conditions, you know, by the time I was probably like 16. And so I would come to work camp? at night. What's that? Were you involved in sports growing up? No, not really. I didn't I didn't have any real athletic ability. I had I had some uh, defects as a kid that fucked me up in my hips. When I was a kid, I was born with uh, uh, defective hips and I had uh, braces and shit like that. And so I spent fucking years and years and years and years trying to like rehabilitate my ability to like walk normally. And I have uh, uh, two. My eyes aren't round. And so, like, I can shoot a weapon really well because I close an eye. And if I'm shooting, like, action, I'm, I'm shooting with, like, both eyes open, moving through the weapon. So, like, for – because I did a lot of handgun shooting for, in the military. So my, my shooting ability is solid. But for me to throw a ball and hit something or for me to consistently hit a ball with the bat or any of that shit, that's, not there. That's crazy to me because, like, honestly, bro, like, one of the things that – I've recognized about you from the first time we met, like back in 2018 was like how straight and still you stand. Like I remember being on that concrete puffing hard with you and like rocking back and forth and like leaning forward. And like, you were just like, you know, your, your stance was a, you were a rock bro. Dude, I've been fucking training my whole life so I could kind of heal the problems I was born with. Yeah. That's fucking awesome. And so, it, sorry, it, so it, you know, it gives you a, a piece. The only thing I was really into as a kid was like my neighborhood was always into combat. Right. And so I was a skinny little fucking kid and I'm surrounded by tigers. Holy fucking the neighborhood was filled with animals. The New England boys are real. I'm telling you, no matter where I go, those motherfuckers can go. And so uh, up and up and shit was popular. So we all would learn how to box from the older men in the neighborhood. They put us in little rope rings and have us pound down and teach us how to fight, teach us how to train. Everybody had a punching bag in their house. Everybody had a bench press and a, and a speed bag. I mean, it was nuts. The only time I saw something similar to that was when I went to Hawaii 
And I was in visiting Pedro at his at his neighborhood in Winai, and every single house had a punching bag and a bench press and some weights. You know what I mean? Like it was yeah. it was the it was the combat culture, and that shit was still popping at that time. So when I grew up, people were still physically violent. Like I remember my old man socking the shit out of people all the fucking time. Like if you got smart at the rest, I'm talking like he's a grown man. He's a grown fucking man smacking people in the mouth in the restaurant for like saying the wrong fucking thing. So like, New England was so different, and that really wasn't my personality type. And so it was funny because I'm, um, I'm a, I was, I'm being raised by master thieves and master criminals, but I really gravitated towards drug dealers. And and the truth was that drug dealers were happier that down deep, like when I looked at everybody objectively, when you, when you're kind of looking for role models and mentors, it's, it's hard to source them in life when the people around you are, are uh, doing what they're doing and it doesn't jive with you. So as much as I love my parents, uh, their, their operating uh, mentality came from their background and, and who they are. And so for me, I was like, Whoa, where do I find my, my my situation because i remember my pops teaching me i bet we were like i was like seven and we went to the store to go buy a candy bar and i buy my bar and he steals his and we come out of the, the spot and we're in the parking lot and he goes here try a bite of mine and i said okay and he goes now take a bite of yours and i said all right and he goes you notice any difference and i said no and he goes mine tastes better and i said why and he goes because it's fucking free and so what you're what you're what you're learning from like real hucking hustlers and, and straight gangster players just I mean just you know some <laughs> the, the kind of shit that's just uniquely fucking them. But you gotta figure out what you take from them and what you don't. And in the neighborhood, what I noticed was the people that were really the happiest were the drug dealers. The people that had the most rank were the violent criminals, but I was I was raised around them. So what I saw was a turbulence that I didn't want to have in my life. When you got, if you're fucking hyper violent in the street, you're hyper violent in the fucking house. You don't really like shut that shit off. It isn't like it's a light switch. That fucking thing is on all the time. Just it's almost like a dimmer switch. It's really never off. And so once you start embracing, uh, you know, real gangster shit, it it it's a it's a fucking bad life. And everyone who desires that obviously never saw it in fucking intimate terms. Until you really see what it looks like when, when fucking shit's going down. You're like, whoa, that might not be the lifestyle I want. But the drug dealers were happy. And I always remember watching them laugh and having a good time. And I'm like, man, I'm like, I'm 11, you know, 12. And I'm like, man, I want to smoke pot and be happy too. And I remember getting my first access to herb. One of my friends, his dad was a, a dirty cop. And he used to steal from all the people that he was arresting. And then Kenny would steal from his dad. And so we would go to Kenny's house and the fucking his dad's dr the top of his. I remember the dresser covered in all the paraphernalia. Remember when pipes used to be made out of like brass fittings and these look yeah, like. Yeah. Oh, my fucking God. That was like the beginning. And, you know, these huge resin collectors and shit. And we we had one of these crazy pipes and he grabbed a bag of grass and we went up on my roof and we blazed in the summer of sixth grade. I was going to fucking private school at that time. I had, I had had some problems as a kid and they, they, uh, they thought I was retarded. And so they, and it was funny too, like in life, right? When people think you're stupid, they treat you like you're stupid. And then when they find out you're not stupid, they're afraid of you and they treat you differently. And they also look at you like, if you're so fucking smart, why are you so fucking special? So it's weird when you quantify intelligence, right? But as a kid, I ended up going after I, I got the, this testing done to find out why I was so fucked up. I ended up getting sent to this really fucking nice private school. But my my home life was merging with my real life. And I was leaving school during the day and I was out fucking pulling scores in the city. And I mean, I'm fucking robbing shit and I'm like 10 years old, you know, and I used one of the lockers at the school as my depository. And I had to, I got caught in, in the, in Providence. So like, I'm talking fucking miles from the school and I'm like 10, 11 and I'm in the city out fucking shoplifting and scoring shit from nice places that I'm digging. And I would go back to class and I would, I would use a locker 
And so I got caught in Providence by one of the fucking teachers. And he was, I, and I bumped into him and I started talking to him like it was normal. Like, yo, what's up? <laughs> he was like, the fuck are you doing here? And I was like, oh, you know, just took a walk from school for a second. Well, they, they, they suspended me from my school for a second. And then someone said, one of the kids said, well, Kev has this fucking locker over here. And they cut the lock off and it was my cash. You know what I mean? It was my whole stash. And so they fucking threw me out of school. And so I spent basically like sixth grade working for my father's construction crew. So my punishment was to go work full time for my father, which was a fucking nightmare. Because like, if you work for my old man and you fucked up, you got fucking smacked in the head. Like, like my father was unbelievably gifted and talented, but that motherfucker was violent. And so working for my old man was a fucking trip. So you had to always be extra cautious. And I would work for all the construction crews that he was fucking with. And because I had been um, raised in construction and I had been like, I want to say epigenetically influenced because my whole family was craft, trade, crime. It was like I, I could operate as a kid pretty decently. So I went to work doing construction for that sixth grade with the construction crew, hanging out with fucking grown men. And so you're you're already being raised and, and, and elevated in your your level of maturity. And then and what, we start was your, what was your relationship with cannabis immediately after your first experience, Kev? Was it something that was, immediately became a part of your life or was it? something? Oh, that man, I was instantly I want to say addicted, but it it wasn't so much an addiction. It was that when I, I first smoked herb on the roof and we got high and then the next time Kenny stole some more weed. And we set up a strobe light in my garage. And so my old man was doing this building project in um, Providence, right? He was building the Civic Center. And every day when, when his trucks came home, so too did fucking loads of material. And he built buildings from all the shit he was fucking peeling off of these operations, right? And so I used to sit back and laugh because when we were in this giant garage we had, you could see like the lettering from who owned the plywood originally. And... Oh, it was just good times. Like when you look back at it, when your family lives outside the norm so fucking far, you just crack up at how abnormal everything was, you know? And so we had this huge fucking garage. My old man built a fucking mansion in the hood. I'm talking for real. He, we could have lived in any nice neighborhood, but because he'd been raised in the hood, he was most comfortable in the hood. And so yeah. what he did is he created a castle in the hood. And I had to have my mother explain this to me because for the life of me, I couldn't understand what the fuck we were doing. It was, and we had a fucking house that did not belong there. Like I'm talking, it was this fuck, it was unbelievable. And it was my father's fucking powerhouse, you know? And so this garage was massive and we set up a strobe light in the middle of it. And we rode our bicycles because you're fucking 11, 12, was 12, right? So you're still on your Huffy Thunder Road and shit with the stick shift. And we're riding our bicycles in the garage with the strobe light high as fuck doing like figure eights trying not to kill each other. Like we're in some kind of circus. And at that moment, I was in it because I was, I was literally flying a bike through a room. Cannabis opened up a fucking mental pathway that let me leave the world I was in. And I, I needed to leave the world I was in. The, 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 my old man and my mom separated when I was 11. But my, my mom had taken a lot of uh, physical abuse from my father. And it had given her uh, brain damage. And what happened is that she had become fucking dangerous. And so by the time I was like maybe 16, 17, she tried to kill me and got committed to a mental institution forcibly. So like when I would visit my mother, she'd be in a fucking straitjacket. So when you, when you have someone who's a fucking super genius, who's now in a fucking straight jacket with their tongue hanging out of her fucking mouth on Thorazine, you see this fucking dichotomy of life, right? And so like my home life was not fucking good. And I was, I was in this incredibly like manic depressive bipolar picture where when shit was on point, it was phenomenal. But when it was fucked, it was fucked. And it had been going on for fucking a really long time. So it had impacted me and how I saw the world and what my what 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 was the world to me. And everybody is obsessed with power and money, but I'm looking at motherfuckers with power and money and they're having fucking catastrophic problems. Right. And so really, where are you happy? And for me, when I smoked. I kind of just fucking left. And I, I was able to find me. I was able to kind of get 
all this out of my head because like, you know, um, once you, you know, when you're young and you get declared fucking bright, you are instantly a failure if you're not achieving the fucking goals. But what people don't realize is if you're bright, you're also bright enough to understand what you want and when, yeah. where you, what, what makes you fucking happy. And the problem is that, you know, you, you don't, you, you just lack experience, but if you're six and you have more horsepower than everybody in the fucking room, you just don't have any experience. It's how, how long was it? How long was it from when you, when you first started smoking cannabis and those couple first experiences to when you started selling cannabis? Oh, fuck, man. I started selling cannabis. It would have been in ninth grade. Okay. So I go, I go summer between summer and six and seven. I start smoking seven and eight. I start fucking around because all the kids, my age, all their older brothers, all their fathers, everybody in the families are traffickers. And so, you know, instantly you're getting to look at a lot of weed and you're getting to look at a lot of the, the drugs hadn't, you know, the, the street drugs at that time, like PCP was popular, but heroin was a highly valuable traffic drug. Cocaine was an extremely valuable traffic drug, but rare. So you didn't have the influx of cocaine. Cocaine came in like 83, 84. And once cocaine came to the neighborhood, and it's really the beginning of the end of uh, overseas cannabis. Once they, once they converted to what they were going to move in the boats due to the enforcement, it changed what we got in the neighborhoods. And that began the rise of American domestic cannabis. Mm -hmm. So you caught a case in 83. Yeah. And then what would have been your 11th grade incarcerated? Can yeah. you talk about what happened there? Yeah, yeah. I fucking, I was, I was growing with my buddy Gary. Right? I was a brown thumb too, man. It was funny. I, I was a terrible cultivator as a kid. And so um, that's why I always tell people that it, it, that doesn't mean you can't end up to be a good cultivator. You just have to apply yourself. And so I, I would try so hard to grow the plant, I'd fucking kill it. You know what I mean? Love it to death. So my buddy Gary and I uh, grow together and we're using my grandmother's backyard. There was an abandoned garden that was just rich soil and we would grow from seed back there. And so for two years, we grew herb in my grandmother's backyard. And then I grew, uh, we, and my father, the house that I had, had a big giant fucking backyard, like an acre or two. And in the back of it, my father used it as a landscape depository. My father was a master at fucking all kinds of shit, like any kind of construction, any kind of landscaping. I mean, a fucking genius, like unbelievably fucking talented, right? So he had his depository at my property among fucking others all over the place with all this material. But I had been raised in his world and I knew that that fucking loam was rich. And I was like, oh, this is some topsoil that's fucking good. And so when a bale of the Colombian that was really dank came through, I sifted out a bunch of the seed and I grew it and I filled up a fucking space. And at that time, me and my mom were having beef and my mother didn't know what I was doing, but my mother would, at time to time, my mom would call the, like I'd come home from school and there'd be the cops searching my house. So my mother, my mother would call the cops all the time to come fucking look through my shit. And she had kind of lost consciousness of like who I was. She would, she wasn't with my father anymore, but she would begin to think I was my father and so, because the, 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 her background with them was so fucking tumultuous and so fucked up, it was, um, none of it made any logical sense in what took place. But I would come home all the time and there'd be police cars at the house. So I was really cautious about my criminal shit, right? But I didn't think that she would, she would, she would get the, you know, but fucking moms are smarter than you think. And so she knew I was doing something in the back end of the property, even though I thought I was being sly. And she called the cops and said, hey, I think he's doing something. So they showed up at the spot. They come, they find all the plants. She says, hey, go tear up the fucking house. They go tear up my fucking house and they go find a bunch of fucking hash. And then I'm in high school at the time, right? So I'm, into, I'm, in, I'm in gym, gym class, and I'm about ready to go have lunch. And all of a sudden, the teacher comes up and says, yo, the principal's office just called. They need to talk to you. And I said, about what? And they said, we don't know. They just said, you know, talk to you about something. And so I'm thinking, no big deal. So I go to the principal's office and they're like, no, you go go inside the principal's actual office. So I walk in the office and I get fucking bum rushed by these cops. Right. And it's the drug task force. And they all fucking grab me up and they're throwing me over the fucking desk and cuffing me and shit. And it's funny because my mom told them that I was a fucking violent, fucking dangerous person at that time. Right. Look, at like, that's how big I am now. Imagine me in fucking like 11th grade. I'm like 120 fucking pounds. I'm five fucking six. 
And the cops are fucking tripping out because my mom told them I was fucking deadly. And I'm sitting there dying like, and I'm telling them, fuck you, because I mean, I had been, we had been arrested so many fucking times by this point. And, and there was so much cop activity in my life because of the family. And I mean, I'm somebody that like the fucking FBI dug up our fucking yard on my cousin's shit. So this is in the 70s. So when, when you got helicopters over your house in the 70s and you got fucking cops in your house. And and then I was in I was I broke into a crib one time. Um, we I ran away when I was like 12 and I busted into a house to live for the night with my buddy. Right. We Because we were going to move out. There. I was like, I'll tell you, like 12, 13. And the fucking neighbor saw us and thought we were armed and thought we had just done an armed home invasion. And so I'm sitting in the fucking bedroom watching TV and my dude's cooking some spaghetti and we're having lunch trying to figure out what we're going to do. Because you're 13, right? You're not that fucking bright. But you know that you don't want to be at home anymore. You just know, I fucking know. And it's in the middle of winter too, so it's fucking freezing. And and we're laughing, thinking we're going to figure this shit out. We're about to cross the fucking ice and go live in a boat. <laughs> you know I mean, like, you know, stupid teenager shit. And I look out the fucking window and I'm telling you there's at least 13 fucking SWAT cops. And they come into the fucking house. And when they come into the room, we were hiding in the closet. And the cop puts his gun in. And my boy kicks the fucking door and breaks the cop's hand. And the gun falls into the closet. And I fucking literally leap through a hole in the ceiling in the closet. So fucking high in the air that I come down through the bathroom ceiling. And I'm hanging. And there's fucking cops with machine guns everywhere. Because they think we're heavily armed home invaders. We're really two 13 year old fucking kids. Well, three of us, me, Kevin, and Danny. <laughs> and this fucking shit's going off, right? And they're chasing us through the house, but you're kids. So to you, you just don't really play it. You're not that really cognizant that death is right there. You just know that you don't want to get caught because you're going to have to go home. And so going home was fucking more scary than fucking with these guys, right? So and if you're living in the neighborhood, there's always shit going down. And my my neighborhood was this peninsula that stuck out into the water. And there was this huge recreational area at the end of it. So at one time, my area was beautiful. And then the hurricanes destroyed it. The economy got fucked. The poor move in. Poor become the norm. And what you have now is a fucking place that has unbelievable vista. But you've got to get through a jungle to get there. And the What, what area was that? This is uh, Oakland Beach, Rhode Island. And so Oakland Beach, the model when I was a kid was Oakland Beach where the debris meets the sea. And there was a fucking, there was a logo of a drunk seagull sitting in a fucking chair surrounded by garbage looking at the ocean. Oh, like a fucking New England of the 80s was a fucking mess, right? They cleaned it up tremendously. It's been gentrified. My, I don't even know yeah, where I, my people I, went. I don't know if Jameson told you, but I was born in Taunton. Yes. And yeah. I, yeah. No, I, you're East Coast. I went to college in, uh. I went to college at Salve in uh, Newport. Yep, de definitely. I remember because I, I used to I used to like to run, and um, I remember going running over at Salve Regina. Yeah, it's beautiful over there. Where yeah, you, stunning. Uh, where did you spend your time in uh, in eighty three? I went to I, I, get, I so I get snatched up out of fucking high school, right? And they they I'm, check this shit out. Like I'm talking, I'm about to eat fucking lunch. So I get snatched up. I get taken to the fucking work police department, right? And the whole time I'm talking shit to him. I'm like, fuck you guys. Fuck you guys. Because I know I don't have anything on me. And and you got to remember, every single person I'm hanging out with is, is we're already, already young fellas. My first real criminal case was in ninth grade. I got into a fucking fight with some kid. I stole some shit like an idiot. I rob a case of soda from the soda fucking thing. The dude confronts me. And I'm with my fucking dudes. And they're all violent fucking killers, too. And one of them gives me the look of, like, you must fucking fight this kid. And I'm like, fuck. And so, Because I'm, I'm the one who gets caught stealing, right? And so now I got to go fuck with them. So we got fucking into a fight. And this poor fucking kid ends up getting thrown through a fucking window and tur gets turned into a bloody fucking mess. And so my, my, first, my first case was, that's like my first week in high school. And so I already have fucking criminal shit. All my partners are fucking criminals. We've all been arrested multiple fucking times. We've all been in, into the fucking jail. So the whole time I'm being arrested, I'm telling these guys, fuck you, because I know I don't have anything. Well, when I get to the fucking, when I get to the, the, the police station, um, they go, we were at your fucking house. And I was like, whoa, you got something. And I went from my house 
I went right from the police station to the courthouse in the holding underneath. They put you in the underneath holding. And then they fucking send you up the elevator into the courtroom. Judge goes, bam, sentenced. Fucking sends me back downstairs, puts me in a van, and I eat supper at fucking training school. I was I went from being in high school to training school in like four and a half fucking hours. Was that in, in DSS or what, what program was that, that was that was that would have been um the 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 uh the Rhode Island training school, yep. the old youth correctional system. And, and it was funny because you get in there, right? And half of your dudes you've been rolling with have already been in there for fucking years and shit. So when you get in, you get greeted by these people that know the people that you've been in. So you go to training school and you're nervous because you're like, whoa. But when you go there and you're from a violent area and people realize who you fuck with, people get fucking afraid just to fuck with you, period. So like... As long as you're not stupid in life and disrespectful and you pay attention to what the fuck you do, you can get along most anywhere. But it never hurts to have uh, violent, terrifying people surrounding you when other violent, terrifying motherfuckers are there, too, mm -hmm. because it makes everybody calm the fuck down. And, and ultimately, there's nothing comes of violence. That's really the thing is that violent, once you start to really go violent, it's the end of your fucking enterprise. Yeah. It's it, it, there's no there is no future in violence. It's it's always the absolute answer, but it's also the end of the fucking game. You got to switch. You got to switch what you're doing. And so for me, I just never, I never, I never dug it. And so training school wasn't a bad experience. It was just training school, and it was just that I didn't like having to be uh, incarcerated. I didn't I didn't like the fact that I had to go uh, live in an incarcerated world. And what I didn't like was half the motherfuckers you're incarcerated with really should be incarcerated for stupidity. And so it's a fucking nightmare being in there. And you're just like, oh, my fucking God, you're going to have to spend your whole life doing this shit. And it's just not a positive place to be. The people who run it have power freak issues. A lot of the people that are incarcerated really have emotional developmental issues. And they what they needed was support and counseling and, and, and some kind of fucking compassion. And instead, what they got was basically thrust into a fucking meat grinder and they come out surviving any way they can. And then they get blamed for being a fucking societal failure. When the truth is that the society failed them. Yeah. So, so you understand it, you're like, fuck. So you get out of you get out of um training out of, school, training school. 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 And mm -hmm. where, where's your head at? You know, are you you're clear, your head's on straight, or, or where are you at right now? I'm cool. Um 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 I get out of training school and at that time, right when I got out of training school was when my mom ended up got committed. And so I was on my own from that minute. And what I did is I had the, I had the house and I was I just supported myself. I worked doing construction. I was going to high school. My my senior year, I bet I missed like almost 60 fucking days of high school and still fucking passed. If if I I was I was relying on my fucking intellect to to carry me through school without using any work and it was really my grandmother wanted me, my family had gone through the depression. And so for my grandfather who didn't get a high school diploma and, and like the, at those, at that time, it, you didn't get an education if you were from poor New England. And even though they were bright, hardworking, smart people, this was like some milestone. And so I fucking made sure I graduated so that I could give my diploma to my grandmother. And that's cool. <laughs> yeah. Because I loved my grandmother and she was a good woman. And she was really kind to me and she helped me a lot because she understood what was going on in my life, but there was really not much you can do except be supportive, you know? And so she was always mm -hmm. just a really good woman. And my grandfather was a good man, but they, they came from a time when like for my grandmother, the depression meant that her mother and father gave her and her seven brothers and sisters to the fucking orphanage for three years to survive. So they wouldn't starve to death and the fucking nuns molested her. So she, she comes out of the fucking orphanage fucking damaged and, it was with me, she kind of had this new relationship where like I got to see the beautiful Cecile that the kids didn't see because the 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 healing of the fucking orphanage years. All those kids that went through the orphanage did not have a fucking good time. And so I got to experience like a, a tenderness with my grandparents that no one else had. My grandfather had to go to work at like 12 to keep the family alive and shit. And so they were seen as fucking brutal. But the truth was that they had to be just to live. 
And mm-hmm. so for me, you know, when I got to see them in, in their older years, they were just tender to me. And so it, it provided me a, 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 a normal family picture that helped me understand like that type of um, base because mm-hmm. my, 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 my home base was a fucking radically different. So you come out, you get your degree and then you immediately enlist in the military. No, no, I fucking don't. What happened with the service shit was I took a test when I was in high school and it was called the ASVAP, right? Um, Armed Services Vocational Aptitude Battery. And I was just chilling one day and someone said, hey, they're taking this test, the military test to see like, um, uh, how do you lay out as an individual? And I said, that sounds interesting. So I took it. Holy fuck. I had every fucking military group calling me every day from that point forward where they were actively recruiting me for all kinds of crazy shit because my skill level and my emotional shit meshed for hard shit. And so I was like, it was, it was like, whoa, but I didn't want to necessarily go in the military. I was like, I, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I'm still a kid, you know? It's just that I realized that I had instant access into anything in the service if I chose to go into it. And so I continue, I go through 12th grade, I graduate, and then I, um, I'm working and it's cold. And I remember that fucking winter because I'm, I'm, I'm working my fucking ass off and I'm still a kid and I'm, and, I'm, and I'm paying my own fucking rent. I'm fucking feeding myself. I'm housing myself. And at the end of the week, I might have had like fucking $11, right? And, and I was just tired. I was like, I felt like I had such high fucking blood pressure as a kid. I couldn't give fucking blood. The stress level was so fucking real and everybody around me was getting to the point where they were getting ready to enter the real fucking game. So remember, now we're all kid criminals. Everybody's becoming adults now. So all the boys that I'm hanging out with, that are they're all, everybody's starting to do year, two year prison stretches. Everybody's starting to get in deep with fucking heavy theft shit. All of a sudden, the fucking obligations become deeper and the fucking stress becomes deeper. And all of a sudden, I got friends that are fucking hanging themselves. And I got friends that are killing themselves with gunshots to the back of their fucking heads. And like you're you're watching this shit getting ready to fucking implode. And I was just like, I didn't know what to fucking do. So I went to go visit my cousin in prison and me and him were, were chatting. And he had he had been in the military when he was younger. And he was like, yeah, he goes, you ought to go in the service. He goes, you, you fucking did so well on the ASVAP that he goes, you can go to anything you want, do whatever the fuck you want. He goes, just get the fuck out of here for a couple of years. It'd be good for you. He goes, go do the thing. And I said, yeah, but I'll leave home. I'll leave my family and shit. He goes, but yeah, but it's not really. He goes, your family's in your heart. He goes, the truth of it is, is that you got to go live your life and do your thing. And he goes, and I think it would be smart for you to get the fuck out of here because he goes, there's really not much that's about to go down that's going to be good. And so I, I, I took his advice and me and my grandfather were chilling one day and I saw a fucking commercial for, a, for the Coast Guard. And I, I had a guy that worked with my father. One of my father's business partners was a fucking baller, but he had been in the Coast Guard. And he had talked about when he was young, how he was happy that he went in the Guard because the Guard let you grow beard. And how it was, it had all the same military shit, but it had a way more relaxed environment and it let him travel and do some fun shit. And this guy was fucking crushing it as an adult. And so he was like, yeah, he goes, I think that's a great choice. So I went down and talked to him and said, hey, um, I started having the idea because my whole family was from ocean going people. Right. So for centuries of sea going people, my father crossed. He was the first person to cross the fucking earth underwater in the Nautilus. And so like all my relatives have been at sea. Everybody was a fucking diver. So I've been diving and been at sea as a kid already. And so I was going to go and figure, like, listen, if I'm going to get out of the world I'm from, let me go be a fucking deep sea salvage diver and go work in the oil rigs. So I figured I could, you know, get an education. My old man wouldn't give me the money to go to school, and I couldn't save the money because I was only fucking able to hold $11 at the end of each week of from work. So, like, when you're taking care of yourself as a kid and you fucking hold it, and you're smart enough to know that $11 stacking ain't going to fucking do a whole hell of a lot. And when you're selling drugs, you know that more than likely you're going to get caught and fucking catch a year or two in prison because everybody around you is doing it. You're just like, what the fuck? And so I went down and talked to them and they said, hey, there's an ability for you. If you can compete and outcompete all these people and all these different things in terms of ranking, you can sway your future in the military. And so I got in the military and I fucking went for it. And I made rank at a supernatural rate, man. I had I had E5 in, in, in two and a half years, and the average time was over 10. 
So like I literally worked like I, I get in the service and for the thir first 13 months I was in the military, I fucking basically didn't leave the boat. I got on the ship and, and worked two fucking full jobs so that I could get everything I wanted now. Because I knew that if I fucked up, I didn't have an, if people trip out, but I was like, I didn't have a fucking escape route. I knew that if I went home, I knew the escape route was fucking being in prison with my cousin. And my cousin fucking ruled the prison. So it wasn't like it was going to be this terrifying ordeal. It was going to be the reality of you're in fucking prison. You are fucking trapped in prison. You ain't doing shit. The whole world around you continues and you fucking sit still. And I was just like, I had nothing. So I went at it so aggressively so that I could get the rank, so that I could uh, get the classes, so I could get into the fucking program. And, and then I was a fucking diver in the fleet and I was loving it. And what it did too was because I didn't have any connections to any family, I would, I would allow them to basically send me anywhere as like a fucking dive whore. So any organization that wanted a professional diver, I'd fucking go. And so I was getting sent all over the place to work with the, the EOD. Like, team. What, were you, what were you doing? Oh, fuck. When I was working with Navy EOD, we were, we were mining the coast of Hawaii. And then this was back in the day when they used to say that the, the Navy didn't use dolphins. I was involved in these first fucking programs where they were using dolphins to find the, the bombs. And we went out to the secret fucking facility on the ocean with these huge pens. And the dolphins are flipping up out of the fucking water, but they don't leave the pen because the trainers haven't taught them that they can jump over the rail. It's fucking crazy. And then they open the gates and the dolphins take off into the ocean. And you're in something like a Boston whaler, which is a short, low, tri-hold fucking vessel. And they cut the gunnel out, which is the sidewall, and then they spray it with rubber. So imagine you're in a boat with the side of the boat cut off and everything inside rubberized and you're fucking cruising out to go do the mine work. And all of a sudden, a fucking 400 pound dolphin rolls right into that fucking boat next to you. I mean, like fucking boom, it's in the boat. And you're just like, what the fuck? And you're holding a dolphin, bro. And it's talking to you. Its tail is going up and shit. It's like, ah, ah, ah. And you're riding in a fucking boat with the dolphin. And you, you, they use the dolphins to detect because I would set the mines, right? We would put the fucking mines in place and then the mines open up. And if a human tries to approach the mine to locate it, the mine will blow up and kill the human. But the, the animals produce a different signature. So mines operate off of a hydrodynamic impulse. So they, they sense the wave and hull signatures and prop fucking signature. And they know through computer what type of vessel is above them. So they can allow everything they don't want to go by, go by. And then they go, oh, big ship, valuable, boom. And so they're brilliant. So mines have become quite fucking sophisticated. And I would get to work with the fucking EOD placing these things and locating and then fucking uh, bringing them out. It was just fucking crazy. Holy I got to go. I got to go work with the fucking Air Force, the civil action team, and I got to put the world's largest fucking generator in. They, there was an island called. Uh, it, it was uh, Tarawa, uh, uh, Tarawa, right? So we're out in the fucking like the, out in the truck area, going towards New Guinea, and they wanted to power the island, and it was so expensive to fucking bring the facilities to create a huge power plant on the island that they created it on top of an ocean going barge. And so the ocean going barge has like a million gallons of fuel capacity in it to hold. And on top of it was the world's largest portable generator. And we towed that motherfucker over there and we positioned it in the Harbor in this situation so they could plug it in and power the whole fucking Island. Right. And I laugh because once I got into running diesel dope jobs, I was always envious that I didn't have that bad boy floating in a lake outside my house. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was fucking big. Oh, so like that's so crazy. Are, are you, were you doing like rescue stuff, being dropped? Yeah, in, I would. We would rescue fucking dropped boats. in oceans and the and, yeah, at dropped night? in fucking oceans. Oh, I, I got put in the water like we come out of the back of a helicopter in the fucking shit that was so, it was so fucking big that you can't really describe it to somebody because of the scale. So, like, I remember we went out to go fuck with the ship that we were probably in, I don't know, we might have been, like, 300 miles off of Hawaii, but we're probably in, like, 26,000 fucking foot of water. So when you're in really big fucking water, 
the ocean moves different. It moves in a bigger plane. And, and, and because it's limitless around you, you really are this little piece of fucking floats him on the surface of it. Right. And so when this thing is moving, we're talking like, you know, easy 50, 60 foot trough, easy 50 Jeez. foot fucking trough. And so you, the helicopter times it up. So when the thing lifts up, you hit the water and then you go back down with it and then it comes back up and you can kind of figure out where the fuck you are in the ocean because it's moving so fucking heavily and then you kind of got to get down below it, like, you know, 30, 40, 50 feet below the surface of the water. And that lets you move underwater without having so much movement. And then you can come up on the boat. But the the the, the feeling of it is absolute, man. You're in the fucking grasp of the sea. And it it requires so much concentration. You, you have to be so on point. That I think that it just, I guess it's like climbing, you know, for people who climb or people who do like really high speed shit. There's a moment where you're so aware that any mistake you means you're going to fucking die. And so you have to just release it. And I remember like I was when I was a kid, I was afraid of the dock. My old man used to put me in fucking rooms that would dock with nothing in it but me. Right. I was terrified of the dock. And so he would fucking he was always trying to give me some kind of fucking hard training shit. Right. But that shit didn't go away for a while. And it went away when I was working underwater where I was doing a fucking job and I was on cable. And so I was underwater by myself on a comm with the fucking cable with tenders. And I'm out in fucking deep water and it's dark. And I got fucking slammed by something that was big. I mean, some big motherfucking something hit me in the body and fucking just blew me in the water. And I swung back to where I was. And I was just like, I wanted to crawl up the fucking line and get out of the water. And I realized, though, that it was either make the decision to stay or go because that's really the fucking job. And it's kind of what cured me of being afraid of the dark. Because at that moment in time, that was the worst place you could fucking be. By yourself in the fucking ocean in the dark, knowingly they're surrounded by big hungry shit. Was there oh, yeah. was there one one time that you thought you were gonna die? Like I'm sure there were several, but over. Oh over yeah, no, I thought I was gonna die one time. They fucked up, and we were working in a harbor, and they, me and this cat named Doc, were working together, and they sent us down to to uh, do a survey, and it was in a shipping lane, right? So you have huge fucking oil freighters and shit moving through. Like this is a real, this is like playing around in the middle of a fucking super freeway kind of thing, and and the boats are still moving. And so you're having to be like really cognizant of what the fuck is going on because any mistake, you're going to get caught up in the ship and channel. And the, the dive officer was a disaster and he panicked and he sent us back underwater instead of extracting us. Like you saw the boat coming and instead of extracting us, he said, go back down. But this fucking more and you have to listen to your DO, right? So like. That's the thing I didn't like about the military was that's really what kind of turned me off is that you, you're always in a situation where you got to give your fucking life and you're all, you're all willing to do it, but hopefully not because someone has some fucking odd idea today that this might be an interesting solution to a problem. <laughs> like, please let it be something thought out. And so this guy was dangerous and he sent us back down and he just didn't catch the fact that this fucking shit wasn't bottomless. It was a fucking shipping lane. And these ships were going right over the top of us. And me and Doc went down and found a huge coral head. And we got ourselves around it. And we got ourselves tied on to each other. And this fucking ship went over the top of us. And and I can still feel the fucking pulsing through my body. I'm telling you, there was never anything like me. Me and this dude looked at each other like we thought it was going to rip the fucking coral right off the bottom and send us in. This was a, a propeller that had to have been 20 fucking feet in diameter. You know what I mean? We're talking, you know, we're we're talking, oh, we're talking, you got dropped in a fucking blender kind of shit. And so all, like, I was around sharks. I was in fucking accidents. I got choked underwater. All this other shit, nothing scared me like that. You could feel the energy coming. And when it fucking went over you, you were it absolutely like it was fucking every fiber of your body was... I can still feel it to this day, man. I was going to get sucked through a fucking propeller. Like a spaceship or something. That's crazy. It was fucking horrible. Because I, mean, I remember one time, like, on a job, they fucked up and they sent a... The military always does dumb shit. 
And so we're on this really difficult job and they send one of their uh, top ensigns, the junior officer on the ship. He wants to be in the dive team and they're going to send him to school and put him through the program and all that other shit. And they say, listen, we want him to take a dive with you guys so we can get a feel for it. And I'm like, well, today's probably not the best fucking day. We're out in the middle of the ocean and it's fucking nightmare out here. And they're like, no, this guy's fucking special. He's a specimen. And I'm like, I'm telling you, I don't give a fuck. He's not qualified. And they said, we're going to send him. And I said, great. So they sent him. So we get in the fucking water. And all we're going to do is go under the ship and come up the other side. And we go under the ship and we come up the other side. And this fucking guy's gone. And so I turn around. I'm like, where the fuck did he go? I fucking, I go back under the vessel. And this dude's caught in like, the, the temperature differentials create their own fucking currents like pools. And if you get caught in that cold water, it wants to settle you. And as it starts to drop you, you lose buoyancy quickly. And if you're not aware of it, you don't know how to compensate and your downward trajectory becomes fucking rapid. And all of a sudden you're a couple hundred fucking feet underwater and you really just don't quite catch it. And I fucking looked and all I could see is this dude's face and him disappearing into the fucking ether. And his eyes were the size of two fucking flashlights and shit because he didn't know what to do. And we were going to lose this motherfucker. And it had to have been in probably fucking three miles of water. Like this guy was never going to be found. And so I went after this fucking dude and I swam to him as hard as I could and I got him. And then I'm blowing his fucking BC and I'm blowing mine and I'm trying to tug this motherfucker out because neither one of us have buoyancy at this level. I mean, we're, we're fucking totally negative. So we're trying to pull him out and I'm starting to out breathe my fucking regulator's ability to flow air. So I'm going into total fucking CO2 overload. I'm blowing blood vessels in my fucking eyeballs. By the time we pull this guy out of the water, they got to pull me out of the fucking water. I mean, I'm, I was fucked up for a couple of days. But I would have lost that little motherfucker. I mean, oh, and then we couldn't yeah. talk about it. Oh, yeah, no. The captain of the vessel came to me and was like, you know, thank you for fucking saving my ensign. Um, could we please not talk about this? Because he'd lose his fucking command. You can't have that shit happen. You can't go impromptu shit and then have accidents. If you're going to have accidents, it better be on the books. Then there's yep. somebody to blame. But if there's nobody to fucking blame, holy fuck. So, the you know, that shit was cool. And, and, and that's what really I realized was that, like, when I was younger, you know, it's, you're trying to find your value and what you do. And, and you start realizing that your value is that you, you hold your life differently. And so it, it begins a, a, a series of habits that aren't necessarily good. Because when, you, when you're willing to trade fucking life for success, you become uh, unusually bold. And, and what it does, though, is it also lets you really see that trait in people everywhere you go. And a lot of it is the whole point of, you know, like, what was that movie in Gattaca where I, I love that line in that flick where he said he said to his brother Vincent, the reason why I beat you, motherfucker, is because I never intended to come back. I was willing to fucking die on the swim. Uh, there was no return trip in my fucking package, baby. It was one fucking way. And you you get that attitude when you don't have a home. And so when you, when you leave, and so when I, what I was doing is I was going back and forth, you know, so I go into military, but I, I come home, you know, two years. So I'm, I'm going for two years. I come back two years later, first time to New England and all the herb trafficking had changed. It was all now green coming out of Pennsylvania, up in New York, shipped in from uh, California and it was all cocaine. And all of my partners now were moving fucking work. And so I got to see the radical change and I got to see the, the beginning of all the kids that were born on Coke. And I got to see the beginning of the Coke epidemic in New England. And, and I'm in Hawaii and they have a fucking meth epidemic, but we don't have meth in New England at that time. And then I leave Hawaii. I go to California and I'm looking at California like, whoa, and you're seeing all these different responses to the failures. California was, we would work the shit out of you, but you could do meth. You want to be a drywaller? Do all the fucking meth you want. You want to work at the, the logging plants? You want to work at the factories? All the meth you want. And once they said, we don't need you anymore, they made it illegal. And now what you have is generational meth addicts. Mm -hmm. And so you, you start to see all these same similarities and you start to see the same commonality in terms of personality where you're just like, fuck it, I'll trade my fucking life to survive. And you end up becoming way too fucking intense. And, and you also become so fucking real. You can't really spend time with anybody that isn't like you. So 
you're always pining for this fucking life that's normal where you want normal broads, you want normal friends, except the problem is that they find out what the fuck you really do in your free time and they, they really catch like how you see the picture. It's way too fucking real because most people have been too shielded that they just don't really understand that sometimes even my, like I remember with my principal, I was in my principal's office and he was like, you could be a fucking doctor and you, you, you spend time with the fucking most criminal motherfuckers that, that you could be. And I said, but you don't understand. I said, I was raised with these people. I, I, I've been, I was born with these people. These are my fucking friends. I, I live with them. And I said, yes, I'm fully aware of who they are and I'm aware of what they do. But I also know that when you start alienating yourself from the people in the area around you, you become a, a danger because all of a sudden now it's a, it's a question mark. And I said, and so sometimes, you know, your, your background is what it is until you can fucking move forward from it. But it, it, what happens though, is that you think you're going to move forward, but you, you go into the world and what you see is most people who come from normal backgrounds, they're kind of fucking fragile and they're kind of paper mache when it comes to character where like, they really don't fucking stand up for what they believe in. They just go where it's easy. And if the crowd says, throw a rock at that motherfucker, they do. And so for me, I just can't fucking roll with that shit. And so it kind of creates a situation where you're always forced to continuously live in the, in the hustle. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so all you know is gangster broads and gangster dudes and you know, everybody in the real world and you create an identity. So I always had, um, identities of construction and, and years later, it was all in fitness training businesses, but it was all, it was all real. I actually did them. It's just that that sure as fuck wasn't what I was really doing. Yeah. And so, you know, that I think that's really the commonality with so much of us that have been in the game is that there's this duality of existence that it's exhausting and you get to a point where, you know, you're not really doing it for you. You're doing it for other people. I'm not ashamed, actually, yeah. so I don't really fucking care. <laughs> you're yeah. the one that's having a fucking hard time fucking working with it. Yeah. Well, when you're from New England and you grow up that way and, and you have, like you're saying, these, you know, this this duality and, and, and uh, you're actually... You're actually managing a lot of stuff, you know, and then when it comes to, you know, when I'm in business now and I do stuff and I interact with people that are, you know, warden business school graduates and other different, you know, different people like that, we're all good at business. You know, they're good at business in a, in a very specific way. We're good at business in a different way. And I think it's from having to, to, to do these two different things all the time, whether it was, you know, a car detailing company or a window washing company or landscaping business or you know, you always had to have this kind of cover, not just for the, the visual coming in, but also for the bank. Oh, know, yeah. For the, oh. For the other end. So, no, it's 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 a great thing about, you know, I've, I've noticed a, a lot of people from New England are in the cannabis industry, pretty pretty high up successful in the cannabis industry, but also in the hash business. Um, there's a lot of people from New England that kind of come from that. And I think it's just that environment, you know, and how you have to grow up there. So It was good. I, 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 I wish... I, I wish that it was a little less populated because living in Humboldt kind of fucks you up for that kind of stuff. Once you live in, in, in our open area here, you never really want to have like any kind of tight dwellings again. And so it, because I you do, I, you know, New England's become so can friendly now that it's it's phenomenal. I was just in Maine and I couldn't I couldn't have been more impressed with, you mm -hmm. know, the the appreciation of, of craft quality yeah. is in the mouth, you know. Great place to visit, but I wouldn't want to live there. No, I'm I'm happy here. <laughs> yeah. So Kim, I, I want to talk about uh I want to ask you about lighthouse restoration. Yeah. Um, was that something that you got into through your role with the military? Or was that something you did outside of your role with the military? No, no, when I was in the military, when I was in the military, um we used to have uh what the military does is they bring it, they do these projects where they bring in reservists, right? So they bring in military reservists to, to do construction projects and large scale projects. And for some reason, there's always fucking animosity between reservists and full time military. There's like some fucking petty rank and shit. Right. And and I never liked the petty rank and shit. I still don't to this day. You know, like everybody's got a fucking a value. It, you have to go fuck that up. But you're, you're going to enter the room with some value. And so what happens is this old man's asking for some help and nobody's helping the fucking guy. And I went over there and said, hey, check it out, Russ. I said, I, I, I run this division. I said, when you come in here, just come to me and I'll get you set up. I said, you're a, you're a nice old dude. I got you. Well, 
I'm getting ready to get, and I'm leaving the military. And he goes, Kev, he goes, you getting ready to leave? I said, yeah. And he goes, check it out. He goes, I run, I run this fucking giant mega project. And he goes, and what I want to do is I want to hire you on to, to run a division of it. And he goes, but we're going to let you go home for a month and hang out. And then we'll fly you back out and put you on the fucking project. But as a full-time reservist, but it tripled your fucking wage because of all oh, wow. the benefits and per diems. So I had helped some dude out just by being a nice guy. And he ended up being somebody who opened the door. And what he did, though, was he let me into this project called JTF-5. And JTF-5, there's only five of them in the world, and it's it's Joint Task Force 5. And what it is is, is back in the fucking uh, late 80s, early 90s, the, the war on drugs went militarized. And they created these joint task force all over the world where they were buildings that looked like office buildings, but really they were the brain centers for the, the war on drugs. And when you went into the building, they had completely rebuilt everything inside so that when you came into the building, you were really going through armored uh, corridors. And when you came into the real entrance, it was a fucking machine gun bunker and you were in a kill zone. The, all the fucking air in the building was purified and filtered. I mean, I'm talking this was like fucking bomb proof. You could launch missiles at this thing. And so I got brought in to do all the fucking woodwork and shit because I had had a craft background as a kid. And so when I'm running that project, and which was phenomenal because I'm like, I'm 20 fucking three, 20 fucking four, maybe 24, running this fucking giant construction project for this super top secret facility. So the budget was unreal. And what it did is it let me touch all these high ranking fucking people. And they said, hey, we have another opportunity when this closes to run the lighthouse restoration team and you'll take the military guys. I, I was a civilian, but you'll take the military guys and you'll go and restore lighthouses on the California coast. And my buddy Azel was the lead electrician. So me and Azel take all the fucking military guys, but me and Azel had this beautiful fucking friendship. So we were having a blast. And that's how I came out to Humboldt was to do the lighthouse in Humboldt County. And I, when I got here, it was cool because I was fucking with this chick in, in the, in the Bay area at the time, Brenda. And she was a straight fucking gangster. She had like five IDs, man. But like Brenda, Brenda was a real gangster. And so she had family up here in Humboldt County. And so when I came up to Humboldt, her family met me and Azel and took me around Humboldt and showed us all the places to eat and all the cool people to meet. And I still know most of those people to this day. Cool. So like those connections we made in fucking 92, I'm still yeah. rocking. Yeah. And yeah. It, it was great, man. It was Humboldt was so fucking friendly and good that I, when I went back to the Bay and I ended up having my little brother come live with me, we moved to Humboldt so that I wouldn't have to raise him in Oakland. What, was, I, I, what was Lighthouse? Re what is Lighthouse Restoration? Are you on a helicopter? Are you? Some of the helicopter. Like, helicopters, like, we, like when we did the Farallons, that was all helicopter work because you're on the side of a cliff that's like 420 feet. And so what we would do is we would come in and then I would redo all the cement work on it. And because my family had done aerial construction, I had aerial construction background and I would set up these fucking rigs and slide them around the structures and we would work suspended off the sides of it, jackhammering into the fucking stone, relaying all the rebar. And then the helicopters would come down and we would do all the sling work in the position. And, but all the work I had to do as a kid, it's funny because like, Sometimes I want to hit my old man in the fucking head with a hammer for that shit. But that motherfucker made me do scaffold work as a child where, like, if I fell, I was going to die. I would be so afraid that I would be hanging on crying and I couldn't go up and I couldn't go down and nobody could get me and I'd have to figure it the fuck out. And I'm on the side of these fucking buildings. But it was, it was, he needed me to be valuable in his world because my mind wasn't valuable in his world. My mind was, he didn't know how to use my skills. So my skills were really as, as a, a, a human body, Physical. you know, like in the construction world. But I, so as a kid, you were forced to do some fucking really crazy fucking nutty shit. Well, it, it, it really um, paid off as an adult because I'm kind of desensitized to all that kind of stuff. And so any of the work that involved this nut fucking hanging out of helicopters, rigging up shit, um, I had no, but like we would just it was really, really fly by the seat of your pants, just figure these projects out because they were just really, really difficult, but they were hella rewarding. And it, it was something that made me really proud in that I was getting to touch something that had been built hundreds of years prior. 
And I was mm -hmm. trying to be a good steward like the people were before me. I was trying to take the craftsmanship I had learned from my family and apply it to the job I was on so that when the next people came through, they too could appreciate the work that occurred. And eight times, eight times interesting, man. Aids to navigation is important. You got it. Have you ever gone back and looked at the the lighthouses and checked any of that work? I out? have, I have. I, I there's the one in Shelter Cove. They re, there's a lighthouse in Shelter Cove. It used to be up in Cape Mendocino, and they relocated it. And every now and then, I go take a look at it, and I I, I always look at it different than they do because I saw it in its raw form, you know. Yeah. And but it always makes me happy to remember those years because they were good years. Even the years that I was doing like drug interdiction, right? where the government would send me out to go fuck with like the DEA and the DOJ. It was, you don't, you, you it isn't like you go choose your fucking mission. You, you, what happens is you, you wake up in the morning and they, the command says to you, Hey, grab your fucking gear. We're sending you somewhere. And that means you grab your dive gear. You have no fucking clue where you're going. You don't know if you're mm -hmm. going to go put a buoy in, or you're going to go look for a fucking dead body. or you are going to search for, you're going to map a fucking reef. You don't have any idea what it is you're really doing until you kind of get into the fucking thing. And the drug interdiction shit was crazy because you're you're getting to fuck around with the top of the drug chain. And it was on a on a raid with these Canadian ex-Canadian Navy uh, uh, commanders that really changed the course of my life where we were all, you know, talking about, you know, uh, the thing. And they asked me, they said, hey, we're all divers, too. We're all ex-Canadian Navy divers. Um what, what, what's your plans? And I said, I'm going to get out of the military and go do deep salvage and, you know, keep going. And they said, that's oh, a fucking terrible idea. If there's no future in it. And me and the captain sat down and he, had, he, I, I will forever be grateful to that fucking guy. Cause he sat down and he gave me 30, 40 minutes of his time. And he was an international trafficker of fucking huge level that had never been caught. And every time they grabbed the boat, they couldn't catch him. And the way he was fucking engaging with the DEA people was hysterical because they were trying to talk to him about, let's go have some dinner and talk about all the drugs you're smuggling. And he was like, I'm down. He goes, you can pay you cheap motherfuckers since you can't catch shit. And I was dying because these guys were moving probably 40, 50 million at a time. But this guy spent 40 minutes of his fucking day talking to me about don't go into, don't go into diving as an industry. And he asked me, he goes, what'd you do before you got into this? And I was like the same shit you're doing just at a lot smaller level. But I just didn't want to end up in fucking prison for the rest of my life. I'm like, I just, th there has to be a, there has to be a better life. And he said, there will be, he said, you're at the beginning of a new era of herb. He said, what you got to do is just fucking ride it from here forward. Just know this to be true. And it was such an honest answer. It was so, it, what it was, year so, is this? that would have been 1987. And so I, I got off the ship and I went and got myself a, a botany books and I started like re-emerging back into my cannabis appreciation, but, you know, um, privately. And then the day I got out of the military in 89, I used the government vehicle. I was still in uniform, still in fucking uniform. On my last day in the military in uniform with the GV, I went and scored all my grow lights from Victor at, at uh, Berkeley Indoor. <laughs> B.I.G. Yeah. And I fucking went and sparked up at my house in Oakland and I I went right into traffic. And so I started, I knew that the market back East was hot because I was still hanging with my buddies. And I knew there was two levels of herb. There was the indoor that was super expensive, but that didn't work in New England because New Englanders were still cheap and poor. Mm -hmm. So it was the brick that was their fucking market. And so I started getting to tie in with, with, with uh, different people in the Bay and I had some black partners that opened up some doors for me that I still go through this day, like, like family doors. And they let me kind of live in the world of Oakland from, from the, from the, the purest form. And it was awesome business connects, but it was better human connects. And then I was fucking with this cat named jailbird Pat and jailbird Pat was like fucking like, you know, like Aryan brotherhood kind of prison dude, you know, but he was hella cool, but he, he, he was, he was, he was jailbird Pat. But Pat yeah. was the connecting to the Mexicans. And so I was trying to get more work than Pat could fuck with. So I just said to Pat, listen, let me buy your connect. Like, tell me how much money I got to pay you and introduce me. So this way you can just get the fuck out of this and let me do this with the dude. And so he let me pay him. And I fucking got to meet Alejandro. And once I met Alejandro, it was on. Because Alejandro, he was the connect fucking to Mexico. And so what me and Alejandro did was we worked together to help the Mexicans get better herb into Cali where 
they would bring the herb in and then I would go find herb. And when the fucking, when the, the importers brought it all together, we'd sit down and show them this shit won't sell. This shit does. And we would help them understand what they couldn't send to us. What couldn't move. And it allowed us to tighten up the chain. And all of a sudden, Alejandro's product quality fucking jumped through the roof. Because once they understood what we wanted, which was less fucked up shit, that's what they selected. And we helped them understand that when you sent, because a lot of it was being sent in roof and tar. So they were sending the roof and tar over the cylinders of roof and tar. Those things were filled with fucking weed, right? But if you didn't pack it right, the roof and tar permeated into the smell of the herb and it ruined it. Kind of like when you got cocaine in a fucking diesel tank. It picks up the smell. <clears throat> and the problem is you can't get around it. You got to rewash the product and you can't rewash the weed. And so that was the beginning of me really starting to fucking traffic back east. And I would do one fucking move a month pretty much. So I, so I went back, we set up the connects. And then once a month I would go back to the bay. I rented a fucking garage and I would use it as my like base and then I'd hook up with Alejandro. we get all the fucking units together, we bring them over to the spot, we get them all packed, we get them all shipped out, once it lit, boom. And that gave me, it gave me only, only having to be a drug dealer three days a month. And then I had my indoor that I was running, where I was, and I had killer fucking jeans then too. I got lucky that I got my hands on really good stock quick. And what I was doing with that, I was using it as social currency. I was going to all these parties and stuff, and I was just fucking firing up green weed when no one was firing up green weed. And I was in the Bay Area when hip hop was fucking popping. I was just telling someone the other day, my old lady comes home. I still laugh because I know she fucked him. But she comes home with this phone number and she says, hey, do you know this dude? And I look at the number and I'm like, no, how do you pronounce that? It was fucking Tupac Shakur and his fucking phone number. And she goes, because he lived down the street from me. And she's like, he says that he's in digital underground and, and he wants to hang out, right? And I started laughing. And then years later, I'm like, oh, I know he hit it. There's no way that motherfucker didn't get it. And so you, you, got, you got all the fucking hip hop blowing up in the Bay. And I got lucky in that I got to tie into like original East Oakland fucking gangsters. And I didn't want to be in the coke business with any of them. Like my background in New England crime lets me enter pretty much anybody's crime crew because I understand what the fuck you're doing. I just don't want to participate in your activities, but we can be friends. And so what it did is it allowed me to be able to have this ungodly unique relationship occur with all these fucking gangsters out of fucking East Oakland, Richmond, uh, uh, the part of South and then Berkeley, like just historic hustlers. And it let me see the heritage and the fucking history of the fucking Bay Area hustle. And it was profound, man. It was just such a pure education. And so my life takes this turn to where really I'm fundamentally only with black people, brown people and fucking Asians. And I really didn't hang out with anybody white because everybody white had normal lives and I was too afraid of somebody ratting me the fuck out. So like you have like a hundred relationships that, that you're ghosting people all the time. Like you have a girlfriend, you ghost in this day. As soon as she gets intimate, you ghost because you can't answer the question next. And no, you can't come home. How come nobody comes to your house? Well, it's hard to tell you that I got a fucking whole room sparked up. Um, that'd be a problem. And so you end up having this, you know, this be the beginning of your duality of life. But the Bay Area let me have a killer life. And then we were just moving the work back east. And I was flying back east. And I was going back and forth. And then when the I stopped working for the government completely at, 20, at 26. And from 26 right now to 56, I've been on the run. <coughs> when did you when did you get your spot up in Humboldt? I got to Humboldt in, in 92. Like I said, I got here in 92. I live in northern Humboldt. I think I bought this property I'm on right now, probably circa 2000. And then I ended up picking up the farm. I picked, I did the farm, the nursery, the dispensary, uh, all of that shit in like one week. Like I went after all of them at one fucking time. Yeah, no, I, when it, when it was time to move, man, I tried to move quick. So I want to talk about P cause I know he's been a, a, a major part in, your story from once you got to Humboldt or about two years after. So you met Pedro in, in 94, I think. Yeah. Uh, can you talk a little bit about Pedro and, and your connection with him? Oh, sure, man. Fuck Pedro. He's one of a kind. He was a, 
he was a legendary athlete in Hawaii where like when you go to the fucking airport in Hawaii, there's a fuck there's Pedro's in the airport as this unbelievably talented fucking football player. And if he had been like all things in life with a little more guidance, they would have steered him into a little better situation, but he ends up going to Humboldt state or CR to go play ball. And I meet him, uh, at, we, I meet him at a party. And so at the time I was still, fuck, you know, I'm, I'm, let me think, um, I must be 31. How old am I? The 26, I'm 20, uh, 66, 26. Yeah. So I'm probably, you know, 30 ish. Right. So I'm still fucking wild. And, um, so, and, and, and P's got this huge poly crew. So all these Polynesians are fucking uh, playing ball. There's a ton of them. And I know a couple of them pretty good, but one of them I know real good, this cat named, uh, he, he, and I become friends and he fucking rages though. Right. So I go over there to go, go fucking rage with them. And we start hitting some fucking blow in the bathroom. And Pedro thinks that we're in the bathroom, like locking the door. And he starts fucking panicking, like, hey, look at me in the bathroom. And his boy is panicking because he doesn't want Pedro to know that he fucking really parties. And so he's holding the door. Pedro's trying to tear the door open. I'm cracking the fuck up because I'm watching this shit go down in front of me. And then he comes busting in and, and we're just cracking up. And then he realizes that his boy's shamed. And then he goes, oh, it's OK. And so me and P, that's how we met. And we both really like boxing. And so when I was a kid in the neighborhood, you know, you, you all the old men would teach you how to fucking fight. And they put you in little boxing rings and it was neighborhood boxing. Everybody was kung fu fucking fighting. Like the amount of ass whipping in the neighborhood was nonstop. Every, everybody, everybody was a fucking kung fu fighter, punching bag in the yard, bench press, constantly getting into fucking fights. It was that era, that culture of that time, you know? And so me and P had been raised in that similar background. Even though he's a lot younger than me, he'd been raised in that Hawaiian fucking rough background. So we had an appreciation for fighting in terms of like the science of fighting, the art of fighting. And so we like to uh, look at fights. And and P was a really gifted physical person, man. His physical abilities were phenomenal. And so he was just really interesting, interesting dude. And he had a speech impediment, which he stuttered heavily and so he didn't really speak much, but I could tell that he was sharp as a fucking razor. He just didn't speak much. And so I I kind of like made him talk because I wouldn't allow him to nod his way through the conversation. I basically just roll him over and he gets so mad that he would be spitting at me. But what it did is it allowed him to have somebody to spit at until he got the words out. And what it did is it allowed me to be able to tap into his mind because I wanted to hear what was in his head because he was such a, a deep, thoughtful person. And he was just a, a really unique individual, like royal, royal Polynesian, you know, like a uh, 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 grandfather, like fucking King of Tokelawa kind of shit, like mm -hmm. royal Samoan. His whole family's got rank, all fucking hula dancers and just high level, like that's poly to the fucking max, you know? And all the other polys respect the shit out of him too. And so it was this beautiful introduction to Hawaiian culture. Cause I lived in Hawaii, but it was different when you go there as a white person than when you go there with Polynesians as your friends. And it's so much that you just, as a white person, you just don't really understand. It's kind of like when you go to the reservations in Obokani and stuff and you, you're, you're, you're a symbol of an oppressor that did some fucking damage. And so you, you kind of have to kind of go into the reservation brought in by a native and go into the into the polyculture brought in by a Polynesian, so you can be introduced as like a decent person, because the the scars are so deep because they still that have shit. an end. Like that shit didn't stop, and and then a new dawn has begun. That shit's still there. Yeah. So you get to see the poly world, and what happens is, is we start to become fucking friends, and he doesn't know that I'm trafficking or growing. Like I don't tell anybody any of this shit ever. I'm somebody that never tells anybody anything about the fucking stuff I'm doing. And until I went public, I was fucking private. And he started like, they said, hey, can I, you know, could I buy a bag of pot and stuff from you? Because, you know, I always had a fucking bag on me. And I started laughing. I was like, oh, this kid's so fucking good. I said, listen, I'm going to pull you aside and tell you what I really do. And why don't you come work for me? And together we can go do some good shit together. And then there was a point in time where I realized that he had built his abilities to the point where he didn't need to work for me. And I started helping him build his own operations and I started helping him tie into other operations. And if he got into any kind of trouble, he could bring me in as a, as a worker and I wouldn't tell anybody who I was and he would bring me to the job and then I would lay out how to fix the problem. 
This way, no one ever knew that, you know how it goes. It's always about perception of if you're the man, you got to know. And so the main thing is just to keep your mouth shut and bring in people who do and then give the answer. And so what it does, it allows you to move projects forward. And so we created the support system where he helped me when I needed help and I helped him when he needed help. And we helped each other in ways we needed. And was it just indoor cultivation, Kev, or were you doing some guerrilla stuff? Oh, yeah, we did guerrilla outdoor, but a lot of indoor at that time. Indoor was heavy. And what happened was I had I had, I had, had hooked up with some dude out of SoCal, right? This cat named the Jewish Cowboy. And, and oh, this motherfucker was wild, right? So I hook up with the cowboy. And the cowboy, the cowboy is a fucking gun fucking slinging lunatic. And we still, we still partners, but this motherfucker was live. And he was finding clients at a, at a rate that was almost ridiculous about people who wanted operations put in. Because what had happened, Jameson, is years ago, the number of, the amount of weed you could harvest was about a pound of light, right? Pound of light was the benchmark for weed. And I thought that that shit was, was fixed. I didn't think that it was a real number. And what I knew that if I could fucking tighten the variables up, I could find the equation to go to higher levels because I knew that it had to been a synergy of, of effects to make something occur. And so I'm talking to somebody and they're like, man, you need to go and d- get a spreadsheet and start laying this out. Now I didn't know what a spreadsheet is. This is going to be 90, 96 right? 97 time, right? And so lo and behold, I'm in the Bay Area at one of my dude spots and he's got like 50 hot Pentiums from a fucking score they pulled at an office building. And it was the new Pentium 75, right? The best computer that, you know, the the Dell, right? And I was looking at it like, I didn't know what the fuck the things are. But I took like 30 of them from him because I knew that I could move them. And I took them home and I went and got computer magazines because there was no fucking internet for me. I didn't know how to turn a fucking computer on. And I went and got magazines and read the magazines to understand computers. And then I read all the books that were with every computer and I fucking assembled the best computer from all the computers. And then I went to adult ed and took a class on how to fucking do a spreadsheet. And now I could compare. And because I had so many operations, I could isolate variables and I fucking figured it out in probably 97. And I went to two pounds, 2.2, 2.4, 2.5. And what happened was I started creating this thing where I could come into your life and say, listen, if you let me run your world, I'll give you a pound of light. And everyone would think you're the dumbest motherfucker ever. But I'd walk in and then slay it and pull more money than you just by showing up and running your op. And so it only lasts for a, a cycle or two before everybody's like too angry that you're making too much money. But it let me work fucking everywhere because any place I touched money was flying. And so Cowboy was laying out contracts everywhere. I was putting in operations all over the fucking planet. Me and P were, were, were putting in shit for him. I had my brother working on operations in fucking Honeydew that were like combined where they had outdoor and indoor uh, operations. But at one point in time, Jameson, I had five operations on one fucking street. I used to change cars and clothes and fucking hairstyles to go house to house. It got so crazy that if that there was a point in time where my girlfriend had to meet me at a grow in order to fucking physically see me because I was working like around the clock, 24 hours a day. Cause every grow that I would fuck with, I made sure I entered it at the right time so that it didn't cause problems. Were you typically like, growing the same thing across the board? I had, well, no, I had, I had the nursery. See what happened was I started, I started collecting jeans because like, like in the Bay area, I got lucky and I got some killer, I got some killer outdoor from Mendo. And that started my whole cultivation game with some really good outdoor Mendo bud had two seeds in it. And out of that came, those two seeds came a female and she was unfucking believable quality. To this day, she'd be unreal, right? Mendo the, bud, like could, any other lineage than Mendo? Oh bud? God, no! Just fucking Mendo outdoor. I know that. I know right. that it was four hundred bucks right. an ounce. I know that. I know that I paid four hundred for that ounce, and I paid four hundred for it again. It was fucking a plus herb, and and come trafficking right. And so like you know where and I, and I had connections, and so this chick named Sue was my connect for the high grade, and so Sue had access to the really good black hash, and she had access to the killer fucking herb out of Mendo and Humboldt. And so I got seeds from that to start my indoor in the rock wool. But I met this dude named Ralph and me and Ralph become friends. And Ralph turned me on to my first California skunk. And Ralph gave me a branch of it. And I learned how to clone in probably 90 to keep that branch alive. 
So I learned how to clone in 90. So I already knew how to clone. So once I get up to Humboldt County, I knew how to propagate. And I started becoming fascinated with all the different types of cannabis I was seeing in Humboldt because it was everybody had their own thing. And so at that time, people didn't grow the same shit. Every crew grew its own thing. So every family had their thing. And I mean, when you went to their house, they only smoked that thing. Like it was it was fucking brand loyalty to the limit. And it was great because everybody had really good shit. And so I was collecting all these things and people were weird with jeans. And so you always had to have something of value to make a trade. So I ended up fucking flying up to Canada in probably like 97. And I tied in with the Canadians up in BC and I started scoring jeans there. And I started bringing the jeans back here to Humboldt County and started making the connect of flipping jeans. And I started banking jeans. And all of a sudden I started building these operations and I realized that my data was based off of the plants that I was holding. And I realized that in order for me to replicate the system, I had to put the whole package together. But at the time, I probably had close to like nine or 10 different plants that could all do two, two plus in a 55 to 60 day frame. So I had I had collected a, a, an assortment of stuff through the R&D. And anybody that you're making money with, if 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 once you once you are making money for people, man, motherfuckers start calling you Midas because everywhere you go, money's raining down. And what it did for me was that I wasn't, it, it was funny. I, I was never as big as the people that I fucked with. And I never had the aspiration. And, and a lot of it was most of the cats I fucked with, a lot of them ended up catching fed time. Uh, once the heroin got here, everybody got into heroin and, and I'm terrified of that shit. So I'm like, uh, you all fucking, you, you all do the heroin, but I ain't fucking with the heroin. In, and, in those days, Kev, were you just moving packs or were you also moving cuts as well on a large scale? The, I was moving the, it was the beginning of the cuts because what I was doing was I was building these operations for these people and I was creating these models and the models would have to go along with the genes because otherwise I couldn't give you the data set. So what made it unique was that I could like come into your life. I could build your operation. And what I had done is I had studied at uh, this would have been same time. I think, um, 95, 96, I went to college to get a nursery practices degree, but mostly because I just wanted to be able to in, in enjoy some education because my childhood had been so fucking crazy. I, I wanted to experience some scholastic shit. And a, and a woman that I was with at the time said, Kev, you would love to go to JC. You got free time. So I said, well, let, let, let me make it make sense for me. And so I took a nursery practices business administration. So it let me see the the rhythm of, of what business is from a academic point of view, and then also cultivation from an academic point of view. So I could get the vocabulary so that I'd be able to have conversations with people and actually have uh, no amb ambiguous or vague terms. And it, it was a great opportunity because it, it let me enjoy scholastic shit. And then I was going to go on to HSU with that same combined, um, you know, uh, ag business major, but the business was so hot at that moment that I just couldn't turn down the fucking hustle. And I realized that I was going to school for my enjoyment and also for, you know, maybe the potential to have a future. But when I went to a mega facility and talked to the lead grower and he was making 80 grand running 3 million square foot of Lily, I realized that commercial ag is fucking bunk. And I knew that it was going to be bunk when it came our term too. So all my homework had been done really in the 90s, Jameson. Everything that I, I understood to be the future was based off of the research I did then because I knew I was trying to launch a trajectory. I realized that if the captain of the drug smuggling boat was right, that means that the future was going to be cannabis. I, I said, let me put myself in positions where I'll be viable this whole time then. So what I tried to do is I tried to be technically intelligent about cannabis to where I could come in and like fucking build you an operation. I could put the right genes into it. I could put the genes into it that sell. I could find the people to, to sell the weed to. How much? Let the... me create the verticals. You know what I mean? I was practicing building verticals. I was trying to learn how to develop the abilities that I think I was going to need in the future. Yeah. And the real one was respect where people, people fundamentally trust you enough where they say most of the time you're pretty fucking on it. And I think that's really what it comes down to. Ooh. What do you got so, there? So, no, let me ask you, Kev, like, how much of that, how, how, how much of the 10 or 12 cultivars that you had at that time were purple? Only one. And it was the purple. 
that surprises me. Only so, one because purple wasn't purple was not the problem was is that perp perp's really associated with lower potency. And so back in the day, if you compare them, purple haze is not as brutal as green haze. So there, what and, was, I mean, what there's something in the where? gene. What's that? What was moving where? Like what was your lineup? Oh fuck! At that time period, it was it was still the era of skunk. So I had a whole bunch of killer skunk cultivars that stacked. I still think I had the best plant I've had to this day. The, the I, got, I lost it in a raid, but it was it was a, a skunk that looked like a stick until like day forty, and then from forty to seventy, it just filled out in these pyramid-like clusters with almost no leaves, and it was so devastatingly strong that when you smoked it, if you weren't a frequent smoker, you thought you were going to go into fucking respiratory distress. It was devastating. It was, it was a buddy of mine, Brian gave it to me. His friend, the friend's dad was head of the drug task force and had been fucking raiding and wreaking havoc for years. And he brought that cut to his son and said, of all the years we've been raiding dope, this is the best dope we've ever seen. And he knew his son was a grower, brought him the fucking plant. And then I get it. And it was the nastiest of all the skunks I've ever fucked with in my life where it had every bit of the foul, rank, disgusting odor, but it didn't have that leafy, open structure. It just formed these cylindrical, twisting fractals of pyramid-shaped fucking bract clusters. Phenomenal. And then I had a ton of shit because everybody that I bumped into, what, what I was doing then too is I was doing what I'm doing now, like I've always done, is that the the world of cannabis was always um, very closed off in terms of information sharing because each person believed that their little edge gave them this advantage in this incredible fucking micro market. Well, the thing is, I had been raised in the the in people moving bales. Then I get in the military and I'm looking at a hundred fucking tons at a time. So my idea of how much herb was being used and consumed was different than most people I met. And so what I knew was that there was no protecting any of this shit. What you wanted to be able to do is maintain movement and by allowing there to be people to succeed with what was currently available, because if they could succeed, maybe they would be another link in a chain that we would all be able to work with. So to me, it was like kind of like link building. So I was I was a heretic to a lot of people because I was hanging out with the elite because I was somebody who had cracked a code that motherfuckers couldn't crack. And I made it look easy. And I was doing, and I was integrating and putting shit together. And, and I was so fucking on it. Like, I mean, I had given up my, I gave up my fucking relationships where my old lady was in tears and she was just like, you're obsessed. And I said, oh, it's way past obsessed, baby. It's possessed. Yeah. I said, it, it's, it's, it's got me. I'm not in control anymore. And I went on that fucking path, right? And so when you're somebody who's cracking the fucking code and you can move into any lane, it allows you instant access to the upper echelon. But the problem is upper echelons are self-proclaimed usually. Who's defined you as upper echelon? And usually it's yourself because when you look around, you got more money or you're cooler or you're better looking than your fucking friends. So you think you high level. Yeah. And to me, that's like some fucking lame ass shit. And what to me is high level is are you a fucking decent human being? Because given a good circumstance, that's the fucking main thing that matters here. And so what I did is I just allowed nice people to bump into me in life. And I would allow them to benefit from who they met. Like probably like I'd say, listen, I said, you, you could use some help. And I would, I would help them. And I wouldn't ask for anything. I would just be like a friend. And it was, it was genuine. And it just allowed me to enjoy like camaraderie in a, in a healthy way. And it was allowing me to enjoy herb is not business. And it was allowing me to take my skills and empower other people to make money. Well, man, I empowered a lot of motherfuckers to make a lot of money. What, and uh, it what was a year, really positive thing. What year did you first see OG, Kev? Oh, the first time I would have seen OG would have been like uh, earlier 2000s, you know, 202. Because, you know, 91, it pops out. But we heard about it and stuff. But and, and it was making crazy numbers in Los Angeles. But the thing was that, you know, you had to go to L.A. to go fuck around where for us, you know, we could we could move regular pot for, you know, at the time 
48 was a zenith to me, but you know, that 42 ticket, 40, 39 to 42 lasted for a long fucking time. And so if you can make fucking 4,000 in the neighborhood for regular pot, you don't care about OG. You really don't give a fuck. And that's what really had happened. Humboldt just, we were moving so much herb to so many, I mean, fuck, we were doing 8 billion a year in wholesale, Jay. You know, that it's an incredible amount of pot coming out of here. But what happened was, you started to have the 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 internet really starts to fucking heat up and OG really benefited from the internet to where it started to drive the heat. And I think that if we really look at the next one happen, cookies is the one where the internet fucking blew that thing up. Just perfect timing. See, OG was a little too soon for the net. It lived in Overgrow and it lived in some of the old school fucking heaven stairway forums and shit, but it didn't bow. Uh, but cookies did because the internet now was popping. Mm -hmm. So let me ask then, when did the purple influence start becoming a, a mandatory thing to get those packs moved in the Bay? Like when, what year did that, did that, that would have been, that would have been, you, you, you know what? It all kind of goes along with, there's like this little perfect storm, Jameson, the, the Californians become fucking greedy and and sloppy and we start growing fucking bunk and we're, we're not doing a good job seattle's kicking our fucking ass portland's kicking our fucking ass and bc is burying us because they got cheap electricity right and so you're starting to have this this fucking murmuring of problem and all of a sudden you got the 9-11 and it shuts off canada which really saved california so right around mm -hmm. 2000 i see the perp come out but we couldn't move it. it. 99, 2000. Yeah, I see it around I 2000, right? If I, my friend brings me over to a warehouse and he's like, Kev, he goes, I got a 40 pack of this shit. Nobody wants to buy it. And I'm looking at it and I'm like, wow, look at these little tiny purple footballs. They're so interesting. And the smell was incredible. And I said, well, fuck, give me a cut. And so I just ran the cut as a cut, but I was able to grow plants that were yielding two, three times the amount for the same amount of well, money. So there was Well, no it was like the, well, the Calio, it was like the Calio the salmon creek big bud yep there was certain stuff there was certain stuff that was like you were talking about there was certain stuff that was yielding so well that perps really wasn't able to sort of get popular and no people got addicted to that like fucking fruity crazy it's a, it's, flavor that it's wasn't the, it's in the, the blunt other stuff. it's the blunt addy man like yeah, see we were moving we, we're moving yeah i go down to the bay and I had just come through a couple of drug busts, right? So like when, so I go through the purple era, that 2000 purple comes in, I got the cut and nobody wants purple. Um, you go two years into the future with 202, right after 9-11, only purple selling. Well, and, it was like Sour D was king at the time. Yeah, Sour, and it and got fucking trunched by the perp. Yeah, and it, the well, perp, it was like Sour D was king and anything that was that conifer, which was like big weight, sticky as shit. Mm -hmm. That was, you know, and that was like Salmon Creek, Big Bud, you know, those other ones that sort of had the ring. But you're no, I, I think it is, it probably is the backwoods or not backwoods at the time, but I think it was uh Swishers. Does the blunt? The so it was just, it, it's yeah. the light in the street, too, man. Like, I, 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 I'm someone that's so fucking like, you know, how it is when you're obsessive, you know, what it is. I went you know into the streets to find it out might, how they moved that shit. You know what I think it might be? It might be the phone camera and the light on the phone. It's it's there wasn't a phone then. There was well, no was, phone yeah. in so 2000. It was, it was yeah. the fucking street light. Yeah, I'm telling something. you, we were moving so <laughs> much fucking weed in the bay, and I I had tied all my guys into the crew, right? So all the guys that we were fucking with in the bay were all um really from the coke game, and I tie all my friends into that crew so that this way they had safe business connects to do business with. I had just gone through two different drug busts, and I really had no desire to be involved in another criminal operation that was hot because I was tired. I'm like, fuck, you can only get fucked up so many times. Right. So I, yeah. I pulled off to the side, but I connected all my crew. And so when they made the fucking move, I would know when the pounds were going down South. And if I was down South hanging out, I would go with my dudes and I'd have them take me into the streets and have their dudes serve us through the window. I wanted okay. to understand what the fuck was making this shit move. And when the bag hit your hand under the street light, the orange carrot hairs against that fucking fuchsia instantly allowed you brand recognition. It was the first time you could say unequivocally, that is a thing. And well, it reeked too. It had, yeah, it and, and it really rose with smell. the blunt. 
and the blunt requires flavor. Otherwise, it just tastes like tobacco. And so you had a variety that had the right everything for that right moment in time. And when it blew up, it's really what it did is it wiped out all the genes. And it actually saved Humboldt County, saved California, because I'm telling you, BC was about to take the fuck over. Well, it was also hip hop in the Bay because it was mm -hmm. that same catalyst that blew yes, up cooking. Yes, 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 yes. So the that Bay same Area. exact catalyst is what blew up, you know, that Durbin, Chem, fucking, cr you know, that cookie mm -hmm. that just, that turned it into whatever it was. But Yeah, the no, Bay's that's, a that's, hot spot. So you what a catalyst, a, man. What a fucking monster for that stuff. Speak, speaking of catalysts, Kev, you had a front row seat in the early 2000s to, um, you know, the rise of the new age hash maker because there mm -hmm. was a tremendous amount of trim available coming up from the hills that guys like Nick T and a ton of other guys that I'm sure we're going to have on and guys I've chatted with have said, you know, that was my opportunity to drive up north grab what I needed and get down back down South and, you know, started out maybe mixing in a hot garage, but that's how that, that, that was really the true birth of new age North American hash. And I think you were actually participating in it. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. The, I see, I got lucky that, you know, for, for me, my exposure to hash was from the late seventies and it was from connects that really like appreciated good hash and, and could kind of let you know, like what you were looking at where they were like, look, this is Moroccan hash and this is hash from Lebanon and this is hash coming in from Afghanistan. And you'd be able to really experience primo selection from all of them. And so like for me as a kid in New England, we went through a couple months every winter where there was wow. no flour. It was all yeah. hash. And, and, then, and it was the, mo the motorcycle guys are the ones that had all the hash. Bringing the hash in. And we would go to, we would go to Boston. Well, we had this cat named, I think it was named fucking Tommy Riley. He was an old gangster, but he was now burned out and shot, but he still had the connects. And so you could go pay him to get in the car with you and go to Boston. And then he would go and then do the deal and take some money for the deal. But he had all the connects and we would go pick this fucker up and come back out of Boston with fucking bricks that are black. Yeah. And, oh, <laughs> fuck. You know, so, I mean, I love to hash. And so I, I start looking at the 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 new era of bubble hash and and water process and so i start messing around with some water process myself in that 2000 era and my friend's mom was just looking at my stuff saying you're fucking this all up and i said what do you mean she goes well i lived in fucking morocco for three years let me tell you what hash is supposed to feel like in the fingers when it's dry and what she did is she ke really keyed me in on on how much moisture we have to pull from it before we actually sure. start fucking roll it Yep. And it helped me tremendously. And I had so much access to shake that we created a hash business right there in, in Redway. And I had all the agitators. We ran it through my mom and my mom uh, had uh, my mom was able to recover from the fucking mental illness. They were able to get it stabilized. She goes back into the world of science. And my mom and I are now fucking have, I'm asking my mom, hey, mom, what's what's extraction going to look like in the future? And she sent me everything that we see today. So like I had somebody who was, was giving me premonitions and I knew that if I went into any of that, I was going straight to federal prison. I'm like, Oh, I fucking guarantee I'm going to get caught with that shit. I'm going to fucking federal prison. So, and, and most of my extractor buddies went through some of that shit. You know what I mean? Like the BHO era was really the piece, but I, I was able to have my mom um, give me ideas of how scientists work with extraction, how they use vacuum extraction to pull fucking liquids through materials and fluvals and different methods of, of pulling liquids in, at speed. And, and then my, Gabe's mama taught me about, you know, what was drying. And so what we would do is we set up a bathroom with an air conditioner and dried it in, in shelves with pizza boxes and then I had a commercial coffee grinder I bought and we would use that as the microplaner. And then we would microplane it in the coffee grinder and then fucking press it. And I got a set of rollers and we would press it through the plastic. And then I had some uh, machined metal blocks that gave me like shapes to press. And I built mm -hmm. my own jack press and I would then create the bubble in the rolls. And then the cheaper shit was put into block. And we started then figuring out how to grade Keith. And how much if we washed what we could get back. So it allowed me to have this huge gradient. And it was awesome. But what happens is as soon as people start seeing you making that kind of money with it, all of a sudden it was like shake has a value. And now everybody's making hash and then there's too much. Mm -hmm. And so the hash market was up and down.
And traditional hash really wasn't selling unless it was primo. And even that market was too volatile. And I just said, I'm just going to make it for fun then and not worry about it. Because at that moment for me, I started really ramping up in my clone work where I started basically just cloning. So instead of flowering weed on my indoors, I would just light up 12 lights of indoor and then clone it. And so for me, nine lights of indoor clone was a hundred thousand a month. So like when, you know, when you're, when you're able to generate some real fucking money doing clones, you don't really care about anything else. So I got out of the hash and then we go forward, you know, into the early 2000s and I start to see people blowing fucking BHO through plastic on double boilers on the oven. Yeah. And I'm laughing because I'm like, they're like, this shit's strong. I said, bro, I said, trust me, that shit's contaminated. You're running a solvent through fucking plastic. And I know you did. I know there's no way that shit escaped. Uh, just trust me on this one. And we, now that we know, so I really never smoked dirty oil. When I got lucky that when, when I smoked the first really good BHO I ever smoked that I would consider primo was at that first high times cup. Some old hippie broke out some fucking BHO that took the top of my head off. And then I knew what the product really was. And I ended up connecting the T, uh, Bezel, and I connect another cat, Dave, and I start moving that Paris OG once we got into the, the, the oil years. Mm-hmm. And that was when the years, the same thing, no conventional hash sold. You know, me and Frenchie used to jam it out. And I'm like, Frenchie, people just don't want what you have right now because the tastes aren't there. It's, it's, it goes in cycles. You just have mm-hmm. to allow it to be exposed and allow people to get into it because what people want now is brutal effect. Well, it, it, the problem was refined. Is, the problem was it wasn't refined enough to be smoked on the nail. That yes. Was the issue. Yes. Until so they could get the dabability. The Once they learned how to change the consistency and get the solids out, now you can fully fucking. If, um, well, we we talked about it with Nick and mm-hmm. it kind of went. It was this the e nail, and they started to put these screens on top of the e nail, and then they put the melt on the screen, and they would allow it to to vapor up until it started to combust and then they pull the screen off. And that was sort of the beginning of like, okay, well you could take water and, and then right out. And then maybe I'd say a year after that, two years after that is when uh, soil grown pressed. And then they, there was rosin and then it was like, ah, oh, yeah. Or it was a, maybe it was a flower rosin first, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. The, the hand flower press. Rosin. Remember everybody had hand yep. press. Yep. Everybody had their own little jack with the with their the girls, uh, their girls. The, uh, yeah, it was classic. Everybody had one, but it was oh, an evolution of it, and and it's awesome to be part of all of them because you just see the progression. But yeah. for me, I'm stoked because the what I've seen now is a, a complete renaissance in hash making, but at a micro craft level where instead of the person trying to worry about like I'm trying to become a hash business, I am just a hash maker. And I, and I'm producing a level of hash that is absolutely, I don't, in fucking history, I challenge you to, to, to see across the board, the level of hash that's available right now. Yeah. It's well, you know why? Because now we're in the era of hash breeding. Yes. Yeah. The beginning of this wave of psychotic fucking hash breeders that are, that are pulling all these progenitors from from you know high wax cuticle production plants Mm -hmm. and it's and you know these are guys that are they're breeders you know i would call them breeders i wouldn't call them i I wouldn't call them breeder breeders i I agree with you i think a breeder is someone who understands alice's and beneficial Mm -hmm. traits and how they transfer and when and you know who carries what and i think that's a breeder and i think some guys may be close to it but um reproductibility is also in the hands of a breeder they can Mm -hmm. they can sit there and recreate something like the definition of a breeder is DJ Short, a guy who could take from his supply, like a painter, and repaint the masterpiece again. That's blueberry, or repaint the masterpiece. That's, that's you know whichever one he's putting out that that time that he's doing his releases. So like, that was a true breeder. But now we're in the era, and and hash has gone from production methodology into this renaissance of hash breeders, and and this is the greatest time to be alive because yeah. I remember. I remember maybe 14 months ago, 15 months ago, you know, there was 16 fucking strains of hash for rosin, for solventless. That was it. There really wasn't this crazy like explosion that we've seen in the last, you know, year and, 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 and four or five months. It's like, 
it's really turned into this massive layout of, of everything. And it's kind of like the, I call it like post Wilson, you know, like the post Wilson era of, of the hash breeding stuff, because now mm -hmm. it's just, and, and it's beautiful. I agree with you. It's, totally. There's nothing like it now. It's no, it's great. The hash, I think the cold technology, well, you know, you know, what makes it so cool too, is that you're, and, and I, for someone like me that likes information to be shared so that you can get new innovation, you got it. You, you, Everybody wants to always be the fucking innovator, but a lot of times it's just not you, man. You're more like the catalyst and yeah. you, you help the innovator. Someone comes out with something. And right now, because there's so much information available through so many brilliant hash makers that you can, you can go online and come off of it with enough to begin at a really good level. Oh, and and you or, can or take a course. Oh, fuck. You know? yeah, yeah. No, there's everything's available. And so to me, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm like, it's the beginning. It's really the beginning. To me, the, the two light 10 operator is the future of cannabis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, I wanna... it's, it's beautiful how it all sort of comes together at, at this weird spot where it's, it's almost like um, we're so past Indica, Sativa, the next strain, all these different things. It's now come to this place where we're really about people, the people that are like, who's, who's got it together now in a way that can help innovate and change what's happening next because because you have big business right next to you you are coming out of hair you know heritage and history and that's kind of you know what my next question for you is is you're sort of you're sort of one of those guys that's in that position that's done all these different things and and it's and i think it's going to kind of come from those camps you know from like your camp and, and these different camps that there there are people that are putting so much together and and that's sort of like you know my question is like what's what are you doing next? Like, what's your kind of things that you're kind of laying out next that, that are, you know, that we can, that you can share with us that we can start to yeah. you know, kind of, I'm, I'm not even close to done with him yet for that question. You're not even, okay. <laughs> okay. I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure. Yeah, I didn't want shit to go. You're like, I'm like, get out of here. Ah. <laughs> All right. I love yeah. it. I love it. Humble patient resource center. Let's talk okay. about it, bro. Yep. Humble Patient Resource Center was one of the oldest dispensaries in the United States. It was one of the original spots. And and for me, you know, 215 comes in and I, I vote for 215. I, I remember voting for it. I was I was like I, and I voted for legalization, too, because it, it it's always about um, people that really have need. I, I would I would rather they have need and me have to figure it out than me have ease and and people that have need have to figure it out. So. You know, and that's just a perspective. It's not somebody else what the fuck they got to think. But, like, that's how I approached medical and legal. And so I, I get my 21597. And uh, Todd Micaria was my doctor, right? And so that, me and Dr. Mick have a great relationship until he passes away. He was a fucking sweetheart. And I love Todd. But I knew that I was never a medical dude, that I, I had a 215 so that if I got pulled over with a bag of pot in my pocket, it was cool. If I fucking had some herb and they wanted to, they wanted to pull me over and give me a fucking Dewey or something, I because I, I don't drink. I, I would be able to pass the Dewey, you know, the with the, the herb. I just wanted protection from bullshit. So I never fuck with medical at all in any way, shape, or form. All the years I did it. I go down to Oakland when it's blowing up medical and I'm tying in operations on on weight. That's not medical shit. That's fucking bulk dealing, right? No, no medical in any way, shape, or form. So I don't have any connection to medical cannabis in any way, shape, or form, except respect for like Perone and his crew and just respect for I, I think medical pioneers, people that were willing to take an ass kick and to help people who were sick. But to me, most people I met that were in the medical game to me were pussies and they were hiding behind someone else's fucking wheelchair, trying to sell dope, pretending they were some kind of fucking healer and, 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 you know, this caregiver shit. And so I didn't get to see a lot of honest medical stuff. And I'm glad that I did because when I got to see it in its purest form, it was some of the most beautiful stuff I ever saw, but I had no connection to medical shit. And the Humble Patient Resource Center is old, but they're having problems. They were failing as a business. And my uh, friend knew the owner and said, hey, they want to talk to you. They, they heard of you. They want to talk to you. And I said, I don't want to fuck around. I said, I'm making too much money and I'm having too much fucking fun right now. I don't want a job. And, and that was true. I was in like early 40s. I was fucking killing it. I'm happy. And I don't need a job. I don't need to work for anybody. I'm, I'm cracking. And I end up uh, meeting the woman. At a, at a school function, I go to a, like a school play for my son and me and this woman are in line talking, having a cup of coffee and it's the owner of the fucking operation. 
And she's like, whoa, you're the person that I'm trying to meet. And I'm like, oh, you're the lady that they're trying to introduce me to that I don't want to meet. And, and, and she was nice. So I said, listen, I'll come by your shop and we'll set some stuff up. So I came by the shop and I said, listen, what you guys aren't catching is you're, you're running outdated shit and your methodologies are fucked. I said, so let me put you into a better gene package and let me help you understand how to catch some edges in the business that you're missing. And you should, it should help you out. And it did. It helped them tremendously. And it gave me a good, like a good relationship with them. Well, a couple, like a month or two later, I have that fucking revelation that the world's going to end in cannabis where I realized what the future is going to look like. And when I did, I realized that I had to enter cannabis right now because if I waited, I didn't know if I'd be able to outrun the fucking problem coming. I just knew that it was going to be so fucking big that any, any, any diminishment of the fucking task at hand was going to be suicide. Like I, I knew what I was about to undertake because I realized that it was going to be a fucking cataclysm for the entire industry. And it was so upsetting. It took me fucking a couple of days of really working it out mentally of like what I had just had this revelation. And once was I did, there, I was there like a, a catalyst. Was there a moment? Was there something that, that gave you that epiphany? Like, Oh my yeah, God. I, it, I, I fucking, I asked the question. I asked myself the question, what will the future look like for us in cannabis? Because I'm in my 40s, I'm looking out in my backyard, and I got a couple hundred grand of herb in the backyard flowering. I got a clone op that's punching out fucking weight, you know what I mean, in my fucking garage. I got a, a new girlfriend, the one I'm with right now, my, my wife, um, but she was my new girlfriend at the time. And so we had this lovely little new relationship to where, you know, love is blossoming. And I'm, I'm, my fucking physical shit was great. And my son was fucking killing it. And so like all the things in life that mattered were there. And I sat there and I was so happy. And I said to myself, what is the future going to look like? And I realized it was going to look like an absolute fucking mess because we did not have a resume. That what was going to happen was that when the world came in, none of us had any proof that we had ever done anything. We had done everything in fucking private, that there was no fucking proof. And I was like, oh, you got to be kidding me. And so I spent the rest of the day trying to think my way through the problem about could I hustle my way through it? Could I could I go bigger and bigger and stack the money? And all I could keep thinking about was any mistake I made would instantly set me back 10 fucking years, no matter what I did. And I realized the only way to survive in the future was to go fucking start the fight today so that when the future and I collided, I would be prepared for it. And it was such a depressing fucking moment because I was about to give up my life. And I had to go take a job. And it was so fucking traumatic for me that when I went and talked to the woman about taking the job, I wrote my own contract. And like, people joke about this shit, but it's real. I wrote a contract that said, I have no set hours, no set days. I have no dress code. I'd never badge in. I have no fucking grooming standards. And I get X amount of herb a week for free just so I can fucking smoke it with people at the shop. And she was like, this basically says you don't have to come to work and, and you're going to get paid. And I said, exactly. I said, what it does, it makes me feel safe. And so it allowed me to feel that I wasn't at a job, but more like a mission. And I was able to take that facility on. And what we were able to do is we were able to take a facility that was falling apart and we won best dispensary in Northern California two years in a row. And so the first two years I took that spot on, we fucking crushed it. And I, I blew them up financially. And the, what we really did, though, was was we changed the way the public interfaced with the facility where I opened up the doors to the facility and said, listen, we, we need to be here of service to you. And so if you if you're too poor to buy weed, then I'm going to show you how to grow weed. And if you're too sick, then we're going to figure out a way to get the money to get that shit to you. And what I did is I went to all the politicians and all the locals and I had a bad reputation with the police and like, because I, you know, I was I'm fucking out there for a while. And so when I was, when I would talk in front of the city council, I mean, people would be in fucking horror. They'd be like, do you know who this is? Like, do you have any idea how much fucking shit this dude's done in, in illegal cannabis cultivation? And I'd be like, totally. But that's why I'm the only one qualified to have a fucking opinion. Yeah. And I would talk to every politician privately and help them understand that I wasn't here to cause you problems. I was brought in to help a business and that my desire is to actually do that legitimately 
And how do I do that under your auspices, under your control? And what it did is it allowed the politicians to have somebody they could actually talk to in a normal manner. And anytime we had beef, we would do it privately. So what it did is it allowed there to be education and, and communication in a manner that didn't make anybody look stupid because nobody knew what the fuck was going on. Yeah. And so when the feds were going to shut down all the operations in Humboldt County, we, we, we opened up, we, we were going to open up the first mega facility in the state. It was a, in a, a, a logging mill. And so the mill owners came to me and said, Hey, could we do this project? Because we're going to go bankrupt and we need to know if you could anchor a fucking project. And I said, I can do it. And so we anchored a fucking whole lumber mill and we, we, we started lighting it up and the feds came in and Humboldt County panicked and went to shut down the whole medical fucking shit in Humboldt. And I had the I had the board of soups and the police chief come and spend the day with me at the shop so they could understand that what we were doing was really legitimate. And when I was done, they were like, you are legit. And they shut down all the other operations but us. And we remained. And so what I was trying to do was I was trying to create the beginning of normality because once I get into medical cannabis, it was a good thing and a bad thing. It, the bad thing is I got sensitized to it. And the good thing is I got sensitized to it because the bad thing is you get to see people really going through some fucking struggle and it emotionally kind of tugs on you because you see some really good people fighting for their fucking life and herb is the way out. And it's just so difficult and it's been so shameful. It's just such a fucking real thing. But then the good thing was that it, it polarized me in a way that let me use my tools to kind of fight for it. So we fought for medical rights in Humboldt County and we fought for the medical rights in the state of California. And I was able to use my position and tools to really drive a lot of that forward. But it, it's just such a, it's kind of like people that in hospice, man, like I'm not sure how you work in hospice because you really do get emotionally attached to the people that are dying in front of you. And a little bit of you has to die with them. And where do you get your new life from? What restores you? And medical cannabis was just so much this never ending onslaught of people struggling. So the yeah. HPRC was like a really good education into the world of cannabis of today. It helped me understand that the skill set that I had developed all those years prior, I walked into that business and fucking blew that thing up. And, and, and we would add it and mean, like we were going and we would have continued, but me and the owner had different views of how to operate. And what I wanted to do really was to be a fucking general. Like my, I, I never wanted to be the king. Be a king isn't my fucking deal, man. I'm all, I'm a field general. I'm somebody who likes to wage war and then go home and fucking hang out. Mm -hmm. I'm not really about all the other shit. It's fucking war that I like, but the, the, the fucking glory and the pomp and all the other shit, you can have it. I just want the fucking was, battle. And was so Craig I, from Story involved in that? No, nah, Craig wasn't in that one. This he wasn't involved in the HPRC. And was that uh, Lynette Shaw? Nope, nope. Or? Lynette wasn't in that either. The HPRC was uh, Connor and Mary Ellen. Okay, yeah, I, I wasn't. I wasn't. Uh, I'd never met those guys, but I, I for some reason, I thought that uh, that Craig had something to do with that one. Not that one. He was involved in, uh, um, I'm trying to think this, because there was only so many dispensaries in, in Humble County. There was only a few to begin with. There was like the, the, the Patients Trust in Arcata, and they ended up fucking that up. And then this, this one was in Arcata too. And then there was another one that um, someone put in, but God, we're going, it's almost like you feel like a hundred years ago, Addy, you know what I'm saying? Oh yeah. Believe like me. fuck, <laughs> like, it's just, it's been so much shit, but it was a great experience. But she and I just had a different viewpoint about what we were trying to do and it didn't allow me to do what I wanted to do. And so we had to separate. And so there was another dispensary that had been opened and closed in Southern Humboldt. And there was the problems with the way the laws had been written to where they had created a situation where in Humboldt County, not the city of Arcade or the city of Eureka, but Humboldt County, in order to run a dispensary, you had to buy from a licensed Humboldt County farm when they created the ordinance to open the dispensary, they didn't open the ordinance to, to create the farms. So you have a dispensary that you can't actually buy any weed, right? So, so they create this fucking weird thing. And so for nine years, there's no licenses granted. They grant this license, except it's worthless. And so the person uses it to do some fucking side flip, but it causes a bunch of issues and they shut it down. And so the person who owns the property is a friend of mine and comes to me and says, hey, there's this opportunity. And so I said, I got you. I said, if I take over the corporation 
and then just unload the people, it allowed me to take the fucking licenses in entirety without having to come in as a new license. And because I had done so much work in the county, as soon as I walked in to talk to the regulatory group, they know me by first name. They were like, oh, this is easy. And they handed me the paperwork. So nobody had got a new license in nine years. And I snatched one up in like nine fucking minutes. Was this and Wonderland? Everyone, yeah. yeah. Okay. This, but it was called Grass then. Okay. And what nobody understood was I'm good at fucking reading paperwork too. And what I know is it says that there's no cannabis that can be sold, but it did not say clones and it did not say fucking butane hash oil. And I knew that those two things were going to be the fucking future. And we lit that business up and it just fucking exploded. But it was also a lot of, it was good education and a lot of stuff too, where like, you know, whenever you're doing stuff, if you, if everybody does well touching you, then they're smart. But if anybody fucks up touching you, it's your fault. So anytime you get into public shit, anything goes wrong, you got to take fucking blame, whether it's you or not. And we, we struggled with, with some issues too, because we had, we had pulled all the chemicals out of the system when I was at the HPRC. So when I came into the HPRC, we cleaned up the whole facility in terms of like what we used. And a lot of it was that it was to me, it was the ability for us to have anybody in the regulatory world come through and then fucking challenge them to test us. Because what I noticed was we were being constantly uh, mistreated. Anybody that spoke to us in cannabis was condescending and they acted like we were fucking stupid. And so what I would do is I would make sure I set a stage where when you open your fucking mouth, I'd make you back that shit up. And what it did is it shut people up and it changed how they saw us because they realized that we're professionals too. And so we were trying to learn how do you do pest control and how do you work with pathogen control organically? And so when you're learning that shit, it makes you look like you're an idiot and it just was a fucking nightmare. And so I still have to hear about the super mites from Wonderland. But the, but the <laughs> bottom line was it was an educational process that had to happen. Everybody has to go through it. And so the mistakes you make publicly, and I was trying to tell my team that too, that I'm like, look, we're going to make mistakes publicly. But the thing is, we're also getting a public education. And the bottom line is you're here for the long term. I said, so you got to make the mistakes at some point in time and learn. And if we can all kind of figure this out together, it'll be better. But cannabis was still kind of nobody taking responsibility for the shit. Everybody's a super genius in weed, but, uh, but, but if anything happens, it's your fucking fault. And so you, you learn about public business in an industry where people have been able to do their work in private with nobody to really judge their shit. And because you've been able to make money, You've deemed yourself fucking brilliant and really you ought to just say fucking lucky, but lucky, lucky is a tough word to say. And that's what you learn in like public shit that when you start to become well-known publicly, you have to really be able to rein in your emotions and just say, okay, we, if you do the best you can do as frequently as you can do it, it allows you to have some sense of direction, but it was, it was crazy because we were blowing the fuck up and we were moving stock like crazy and the California economy is going fucking nuts and the growers started having issues. And so what I did is I start, I, I went into uh, the Bulgarian, Russian groups, the Mexican groups and the fucking Hmong groups around the state with translated material. And so one of my partners, a, a Hawaiian brother that passed away a couple of years back, chemo, Chemo was a social fucking animal where chemo just knew how to fucking be social. And he was a full size athletic motherfucker too. So like physically he fared no man and he had a smile that lit up a fucking room. Right. And so everybody loved him and chemo just knew how to fucking do the thing. And so me and Mo had a great relationship. And what I, what I did is I had this, we were trying to do some marketing, right? And this marketing guy told me to come in. He's going to spend this much money to get this much result. And I said, are you out of your fucking mind? And I said, I think I can beat that shit. I said, watch. And so I went through the whole state of California and identified where in the state was the highest concentrations of no cultivation ability and ethnic populations. And then I found out where their supermarkets were. And I translated the fucking menu from Wonderland into Bulgarian, fucking Hmong and Spanish and had Mo take it to those supermarkets. And that's where we passed it out. And we that's jumped amazing. that business up almost like 50 fucking percent in one year. We're talking a fucking extra million for 40 bucks in advertising. That's amazing. It, 2013, it was, 2013 was an incredibly busy year. For, the next couple of years actually were incredibly busy for you. you yeah, also, it was. 
2013 was the, the when you established Port Royal. Is yep. that correct? Yeah, within one week, I, I I I took on I took on Port Royal and took on the whole Wonderland project within one week of uh, together at one time. So for the people listening that don't know, can you tell them what Port Royal is? Oh, Port Royal is Port, Port Royal is just the name of my farm, but Port Royal to me is is it's a place. It's a it's a it's the Jamaican pirate capital. And at one point in time, you know, Spain was so powerful that nobody could go head to head with Spain. So what countries would do is they would commission you and they would call you a privateer and you would get to fly their flag under their protection. You get to go raid Spain's boats and go fuck them and have some protection and, and stay at a port and have a little bit of uh, support so that they could all countries could wage war on Spain. Well, once Spain diminished in power, nobody needed to fund the privateers and they said, we're cutting you off. And the privateer said, well, fuck you. We'll fucking rob your shit now, too. And so for the next hundred years in Port Royal, Jamaica, it was the single most lucrative seaport in human history. And it was so fucking balling that you didn't have to lock your house because it was money pouring out the windows. And to me, that was Humboldt County because I've never had fucking house keys. Everybody has so much shit that nobody has to steal from each other. And that it was just out of control, fucking wild freak the the fullest expression of what happens when you don't give a fuck. To me, that was Humboldt County. And so I named my farm after the fucking port, the Jamaican port, Port Royal, because I was never a farmer. I'm, I've, I've been a, I've been a grower my whole life, but I'm more of a, a you know, dope farmer, pirate than, than a, than a farmer farmer. And so Port Royal was what we named the farm, but the location was an uh, old buddy of mine used to score herb from the people that had it like back in the eighties. And he always talked about the greasy dope coming off of the hill. And then I end up meeting the people that have that land and I end up becoming friends with them. And we end up buying the ranch and that fucking property. Pedro's spot, right. was all owned by the same group. And I end up and again, to use it to grow. And what I get is I get plants that have a fucking freak COA. So whenever I did testing on my hill, I was like eight to 10 points higher than any other test location. So even now, like when I did the product project with the cookies, the two years that I did it with cookies out of the 25 farms in the state that ran the same gene package two years in a row, I had the highest COAs. Yeah. So the farm has a, a fucking stressful impact on the c- cannabis plants and it gives me less pot by far than my other shut. But the quality's epic. And that's what I wanted as a cannabis farm was I never wanted to get into big cannabis farming. I knew what I knew what, you know, million square foot greenhouses looked like already 20 years prior. And to me, that wasn't how I wanted to finish my career. I wanted to be able to have a sun grown, biologically driven outdoor piece and historical region that produced a really fucking killer product that you couldn't replicate anywhere else in the world. And I wanted it at a level that was reasonable to control. And so I never tripped on scale of it because like right now I'm, I'm, I'm tied into a 1200 acre operation in Columbia. So like size is relative, but for me personally, what I wanted to be doing myself was small batch craft. And so I created the farm for that future potential. And then we did the nursery and the storefront. So and- you mentioned about, uh, you know, reading the regulations really closely and understanding that you can sell not only clones but bho um you formed something called the uh humble oil cartel yeah we did the humble oil cartel because the bho was popping right and all of a sudden everybody's blowing houses up all over the place but we're moving so much bho out of the shop that we don't want to see the industry go away we don't want to lose this ungodly income stream that we're fucking cultivating so we create something called the shatter fest so we have the shatter fest and then we have shatter awareness days and what we do is we bring in all these people into a, like the, the old old Wonderland spot. And during the day, everyone would learn about, you know, um, concentrate. But we would go through privately and talk to all the young makers. And when the event was done, we would bring them into the building and shut the door. And then we would bring in the real criminals. And I remember my, my buddy Will comes in. And he puts the five-gallon bucket down on the table filled with BHO. And he was like, any question? Any question about our fucking scale? And it allowed the young kids to get some mentorship about how not to blow up the fucking place. And what we were doing is we were we were running lab analysis like crazy because I had hooked up with Sam Miller, 
early. And so everything was being run through Sam's shop. So we would always have cleanliness and we didn't need to, but we just knew that it was the best process, best, best behavior. And so we were, we were taking these young blowers and we were helping them get their product to a level that could pass a test to where they were not using chemicals that were going to be residual, where they were going through just better process. Because what we wanted to do was see a diverse industry occur. We wanted to see a lot of people do well so we could have a lot of choices, a lot of, a lot of diversity. And it allowed us to really have a good hand in the cultivation of that, of that industry in our area. And when it, it reached a zenith, and then it, once we went into 2018, all the small you know, craft blow disappeared. We went into larger operations due to licensing. And that was like a renaissance time. And now we're into the inverse where BHO was 90, hash was 20. Now fucking hash is 90, BHO is 20. So we were able to cultivate it through that time. But so much of it was, it was just trying to bring in a, a awareness and help because the thing was that when I had Wonderland, like I self-funded it, right? So I, I, I buy the license, we create the business and the business lights the fuck up like a chimney, right? Fucking thing is blazing. Well, I, I, I sometimes, many times wish I had taken more money, but what I did was I gave myself a good salary and everybody in the business had a killer fucking paycheck with every benefit bonus you could fucking have. We used all the money as charity or war chest. And what it did is it allowed us to smash on shit. And that's what we wanted was we wanted the ability to smash on shit because I realized that I would probably never have this opportunity again where I would be in a position where I had my own loot and my own influence. And because I was older, I wasn't really so hungry for like Kev needs new shit, but it was more like, how do you do good shit? If I'd been younger, I couldn't have done it because I would have been too hungry for my own rank. Yeah. But I already had money up and down and lost all the money. And fuck, after one of the drug busts, I was homeless for a minute. I was living in my truck with my fucking dog. Me and my dog are sleeping in my fucking truck in my property. So I still own my land. But I had no fucking crib. And I was hot because I just got caught a second pop, right? So nobody wants to fuck with you because that you're hot. And you're sitting there going, what the fuck, you know? You have to really reach down inside yourself. Every time you have a failure, you got to really like go, wait a minute, wait a minute. <sighs> And what defines you is that you don't stay there. You yeah. just say, okay, I'm fucking at the bottom. Let me climb the fuck out. Yeah. And you climb out. But the lessons are crucial. And so you, you, uh, you, you, after a couple ass kickings and then some victories and shit, you find your stasis, you find homostasis. <laughs> but when you're only kicking ass, you think you're really fucking smart. And if you're only getting your ass beat, you don't think you have any value. Yeah. You know, you gotta, you gotta get a little of both. Yeah, absolutely. So in 2014, your son, Nakona, who recently had a baby, big shout out to him. Oh. Um, uh, he coined the term Gondier, Gondier. And that ultimately led to a number of things, a number of. Yeah, that was the catalyst to the whole, the whole, Gon, the whole Gondier development. But so it started, good. it started with, you know, I'm doing all this shit. And at that time, I think I, I think I had just gotten that. I was in that Pulitzer with the Washington Post, right? So like, I'm, um, I'm touching shit that's never been touched. I'm, I'm on the cover of every major fucking newspaper in America. I'm in pictures that have never been taken before. People with thousands of fucking plants, no federal protection. Like, you know, I'm, I'm fucking blazing into this world of acceptance, and it was blowing my mind because I'd lived so privately for so long. And I, I was sitting in the kitchen talking to my kid and I'm like, who the fuck am I? Like, what, 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 what's, what's my real job title? Like, I, how do, how the fuck do you find yourself? And I'm sitting there like, I'm a dope grower. Cause that, you know, dope deal. And that was what we wore as a mantle and we were cool with it. But is that really what I am anymore? And he was like, no, dad, you're a ganjie. You're a cannabis culturalist. You're just about fucking weed. And I was like, whoa. And it was the first time someone had given me a positive name. I had never received anything positive before about what I did. Everyone else always put a label on us. You know how it is when you're fucking, if you're good at shit and you're successful and you're around other people, they're in horror when they find out what you do. And they're always like, oh, you could be anything you want to be. And I'm like, well, what the fuck is wrong with what I'm doing? Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm kind of happy here. And the Ganjier was that moment where all of a sudden I was like, whoa. I'm a cannabis culturalist. 
And so I told the team about the name and this kid I was uh, that was working with me, Luke, said, hey, we should do a, 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 a platform and use it for uh, education. And so I had access to some really bright people. And that's where Casey O'Neill got his first writing piece was we asked Casey to come in and, and use it as his first platform. And what we did is we reached out to a lot of people and said, listen, I'm paying for it. There's nothing. There's no cost. There's, you don't have to favor anybody. I just want a place where there's people who actually know what the fuck they're doing, talking about what they're doing. I said, all I see is misinformation and it's killing us. There's so many fucking charlatans that we're all looking stupid and that shit's embarrassing. And so what we need to do is we need to create a place where there's at least something fucking real. And that became the Gangier website. And then we used it to create the Golden Tarp Awards. Then we used it for all the spring seed events. Then we used it for all the events we held at the, the, the Wonderland site. And so it was just like an educational platform. And people had wanted me to do a certification, a Gangier certification, but I didn't think that I was qualified because I don't think that any one person is qualified to say you're kind of fucking smart. I think cannabis is so big that it, it takes a room of us to say that this is kind of what it is. And so I never created a certification to go along with it. To me, Gangier was more spiritual, where it was about your intent in general, where big or small, good or bad, like you were about weed, you're real. Mm-hmm. And Greenflower and I start working together at some point doing, you know, uh, uh, video education. And then they say, hey, listen, we'd like to work with you on this Gangier where we want to buy the name and we want to be able to bring you on and help help us shape this idea of a hundred year fucking future of cannabis Somalia ship. And I had done so much research on the Appalachian shit when we were putting the Appalachians through that I really understood that that was all created. And that the French created craft evaluation. It wasn't this natural fucking progression. They were like, we want to sell more expensive booze. How do we do that? We create people who define what more expensive is, and then we'll do it. Yeah. And that, that's what we realized is that we could copy these models because they're not fake. It's just that what you're doing is you're setting the stage for price levels. And the only two price mm-hmm. levels I give a fuck about are what's best for, at the price, which is where most people should shop best value, best price as a ratio, and what's fucking best regardless of price. That's the only two things I give a fuck about. Everything else is a gradient in between, but you need to be able to know those two, and you need to be able to know why. And what we have is so many people proclaiming fucking genius in weed that it confuses every single person who's smoking and buying, and I'm like, fuck. So when Greenflower said, look, Kev, what we want to do is we want to bring 18 pros together And we sat down and we started shaping that list of who was going to be the 18 pros. And when you bring in 18 people that are as as solid as the 18 they brought in, it gives us a really good initial base. And then Greenflower can then bring in new pros every couple of years to add to that as the, the project broadens. But it worked. We were able to spend probably, I want to say 7,000, 8,000 man hours, two years of time to get that thing built. And the, the feedback was excellent. And what we've been able to do is get a lot, a lot of the larger MSOs to send their buyers to us so they could start to really understand the differences between quality. And because we have it in Humboldt County, it lets me bring craft farmers into the room so they get to experience what it's like to smoke like Johnny Casale's White Dawn Rose Hash where all of a sudden, you know, you got the the best hash in the state last year and you got the guy that grew the flower bringing the herb into the room. Yeah. So it allows them to see things that are typically, you know, unseen. And it allows us to create a network of people who are really about cannabis and to really standardize how we how we define quality so that what we have is some true information so that the people who buy pot can be empowered to know how to buy pot. It's not about selling your fuck. Everybody always talks about education. Like I'm going to educate them. I'm like, yeah, so you educate them to buy your fucking weed. That's not education. Education so that they're empowered to fucking buy anywhere they go and make right choices. If your herb happens to fit that fucking criteria, then that's right. But the education has to happen regardless because yeah. once they become educated, now you can steer your product into yeah. what is the fucking sellable range. But people kind of get it confused and it's like, I'm going to teach you to be smart to sell you subpar shit. And I'm like, it doesn't work like that. You got to lift your no, shit up and the education. It's unrealistic, you know? It's, yeah. It's like you're, you're qualifying them in a way so that they're able to use 
these skills that help them decide what they like best. Period. That's what it comes down to. Yeah, know, and, 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 form. and share that information with other people. And so for us, you know, the, what makes the Gan GI I think such a nice program is that there's so many of us that are instructors that are actively involved with the students and it, it resonates. And it's the same thing. Like right now I'm involved with the uh, cookies uh, impact program. Right. And so Chris Weber and burner get together and they do this equity program where they, they do a video submission and they take the nine students that pass the submission and they have them live with us at the facility for a couple months and they get paid and they get educated in the craft and they get people that come in and help them understand ideas and concepts. And then, and I'm one of your advisors. And then I come in and I try to hook you up with other people in the industry that are more in line with you. So if you're someone who's a, a Mexican girl, I try to find someone who's a Mexican female to speak to so that you can get a perspective that is more inclined with yours. Cause I can only give you white male perspective, right? Mm -hmm. So we got black cultivators and I try to find them black cultivators in the industry so they can find people that have to go through similar challenges and we just have to accept the fucking fact that that's how it really works, that my advice only works for me. You know what I mean? I can't give it to a fucking girl and I can't give it to somebody who's not fucking white. I can I can help you understand how to play a game, but some of the nuances I do not understand because I never had to do it. And so it's the same idea with the Gangier where the students come through and then they can connect with the, the instructors and be able to get some information so that they, what they're really doing is we're developing a culture of quality not just you got certified, here's some fucking paperwork, go into the world, but here's here's access to us to help you do a better job so that what we can do is really do the job we want to do, which is get an educated buying base. Yeah. Because once the consumer base is educated, now we can really start to create some unfucking believable div divisions within products. Yeah. yeah. And I, th I think a lot of that education is what led to California's market selling so much solventless hash right now. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's, completely, completely. And well, the vape gate got him too. Vape gate caught him yeah. because you know they're yeah. Sca they well, feel fear. better with squish. That, that's like the fear side was the vape gate, and it pushed yep. them all in that direction. But just this last year's numbers are, are insane when it comes to solventless. You know, in, in two yeah, yeah. separate markets, it's beautiful. Totally, it's really yeah, cool. no, I'm, I'm at it. And, and you've been someone that's been riding this train for a while. Well, you've been ahead of the game. I'm, I followed your career. You, you, you're we, right. You're in front. <laughs> Before we jump into it, because I do want to unleash Addison and, and, and talk about present day markets, I think it'd be a really cool conversation. I want to talk about the one log. That's kind of my last, yeah. my last point here. I, I want to, um, for the people listening and watching that, that don't know what the one log is, can you tell them what it is and when you got involved in it? Yeah, the one log, the one log operation was that, that, that's a five acre facility on the side of the highway in Cooks Valley. And they, they, the team comes in, they build a nursery. They have a local guy come in and build a nursery with them. And then they approached me and said, Hey, would you like to put a dispensary in this facility and just anchor it as a, as a tenant? So you have your dispensary and your nursery now, and then you could do it. Uh, you could, we'll lease you the space and we'll do a dispensary. So I said, Hey, that sounds like a great idea. And I meet the team and they sharp and I like them and it's good. It's going to be good business. And it's right on the freeway. So I get like, you know, 40,000 cars a day drive by. So I know I have good you know visibility and the whole situation should be pretty positive. But as we start to work together, I realized that like, I like the team and I said, Hey, listen, why don't we just team up? Why don't you and I like join forces completely and like we'll take the nursery over too. So the nursery, the storefront can be all of us and we can take over my other shit. So what it did is it allowed us to go from like tenant store owner relationship to like business team. And once we got the team going, we were able to make a relationship with cookies through Jiga where they wanted genetic support. And I didn't, I didn't know Jiga, but he knew who I was. And so he took a trip up to Humboldt and we spent the day with me and we hung out chilling and just smoking and just chatting. And he was just like, Hey, I'm, I'm down. I'd like to work with you. And after spending the day with him, he was such a nice fucking guy. I'm like, I'm down. I'll spend the, I'll, I'll work with you too. So it started our relationship with cookies through the nursery, but it ended up becoming the, a whole R and D facility. So the one log is the cookies genetic base where we hold all the genes. We got the storefront, we got the smoking lounge, we got the mixed light 
R&D. We have the outdoor R&D. We have the, the distribution and manufacturing, and the distribution and manufacturing handles 80% of cookie products in the state of California. So the one log is unique in that from, from, from basically gene to store, we're a true vertical where every operation can happen on site. And what it does, it allows cookies to do all their R&D in mixed light and outdoor operations so that what you're able to do is refine the gene package you're going to pass on to your cookie part. And, and I like the operation. We have, oh, we got seven breeding boxes too. So all the new breeding boxes just came in. And I can't say who's going to be the new uh, genetic um, specialist that cookies brought in. I'll wait till they announce it. But they brought in a sharp motherfucker. So you're going to trip out. And so um, it, it, it's really kind of interesting because it lets you touch the industry in a really odd way for me because I'm not from the corporate world, but I'm touching the largest of the corporate worlds. And the relationship is solid. And what it did too was it, it allowed me to be able to, to have a relationship with them where they're like, hey, you know, how do we use our tools to, to work with Humboldt? And so it allowed us to create that marijuana mania episode where we went and brought in the farmers. It allowed me to tie cookies into about 20 farms so that these far these local farmers can produce product for cookies and then cookies can then do the marketing for them. We negotiated the batch size. So this way as a farm, you're not completely committed to be all cookie. You can just use cookie for a certain batch size. So what it does, it allows you to be able to have your autonomy, but get into the store. It allows cookies to have really good outdoor farmers to produce product. So it's a nice relationship. And it's controversial, man. You know me. I, I touch a lot of big fucking companies, and it just rubs motherfuckers raw. But what they don't understand is that the fucking truth of it is, is just what it is in life. And like when, when Apple is saying, listen, we have this thing called an iPhone, and we need these things called apps. And you're like, okay, I want to build a fucking app. And someone's like, you're working with fucking Apple. And I'm like, well, if I don't work with Apple, I can't put the fucking app on the phone. Yeah. So you really don't have a fucking choice if you have a vision. And what people don't really have is vision. What they have is fucking day to day. So they basically live from morning to fucking night. And I, I envy you if you do that because you get to actually be happy. But when you're living in the fucking future, all you see is train wreck and catastrophe. And all you're trying to do is I call them sword makers. What I'm doing is I build relationships with people who build swords that I'm going to need in the future to cut someone else's fucking head off. And it's that fucking simple that you better build the relationship because you're going to have to fuck with one of these people in the future. And what I choose it off of is when I meet you on the owner level, are you fucking normal? Yeah. Are you normal? When I met fucking Burner, right? The first time I met him, he hops in my rhino and he says to me, my mama, my mama named me Gilbert. And when he said to me, my mama named me Gilbert, I almost fell out of the fucking chair because I didn't expect that coming out of this dude's mouth, right? Like in my mind is, you know, it's a celebrity shit. He couldn't have been a more grounded, nicer fucking guy. We're fucking riding around the rhino and it was as pleasant and as normal a conversation as you could fucking have. It let me realize who he was, which was fundamentally a pretty fucking decent dude. Now he's so, a vulnerable person. Yes. Yes. And so, you know, the, 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 the relationship with them has been good and it's been good for humble County because we've been able to use their tool. And so when they came to me and said, Hey, we got to kill a media team, Kev, what, what should we do with it? And I said, Oh, we should do an Appalachian video for Humboldt and Mendo. And I said, and I know the material. So like, let me cover the fucking material and then we'll let the farmers cover the farm shit. And we yeah. came in and covered it and shot it. And when I did that, I asked probably 20 fucking people to participate and all of them told me that I was out of my fucking mind and how nobody needed any help and how it would damage my brand and I have my own video play and only Gelman took the risk. And then I had to like cover his ass because people were calling him a sellout and I'm like, Jesus fucking Christ. So then I go back and talk to the dude that was talking shit about his video play and I'm like, I took a look. I said, you got 343 fucking views. Fantastic marketing. You're missing the point. You don't have to sell the fuck out to work collaboratively. You can fucking hold your integrity. No one's screwing anybody. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and the thing is that like, and for him, you know, some of his backstory shit and the hustle, but I'm like, Jesus Christ, everybody I meet that's in the dope game. I'm like, what were you all fucking virgins and priests and shit while you were selling weed? Everybody is a, a I know you were a fucking philanthropist too. You didn't keep a buck of the cash. I'm just like, no. come on. Didn't anybody Thanks. fucking do any gangster shit? You know what I mean? No. Fuck.
No, I mean, it's go, go ahead. ahead. I, I think it's incredible, you know, like Kev, of course you've got your haters, but um having been be able to still maintain a tremendous amount of respect on on the traditional side still continue to show face, continue to produce content, continue to draw crowds at, at, at uh, more traditional events like Josh's um, regenerative conference and be able to, to work with these groups and then come on and address it head on. Um, you know, I, I've got a tremendous amount of admiration for it. And as somebody who works in, in, in the legal space in the Canadian market and internationally, like I, I, at some point you have to play ball. It's, 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 you've got to make the app for the iPhone. Like, I think that's a great um, comparison you make. What do you, what do you attribute? Uh, what, what do you attribute to being able to stay so relevant when some of your peers that are similar in age to you have struggled in some ways to do so? Fucking desire. Desire, I, I, I want to stay relevant, but not because I have to be in the full. I don't need to be in your mouth. I don't need to be like in the picture. It's not about that. It's that I'm so interested in what I do that I just allow that interest to take over. And, and I make sure that I never think I'm so fucking smart that I have it under wrap. So mm -hmm. I'm always looking at new people coming up. I'm always just trying to ask questions, you know, what's popping? What do you like? What's you, how do you guys function with this stuff? I'm always trying to see what the new people are doing, younger kids, older consumers, people that are in, in, in consumer packaged good industry. Like I don't give a fuck if it touches my world, I'm looking at it. So that mm -hmm. way I can understand how it's going to impact me, but it's because I, I just don't want to leave. You know, my lawyer asked me that too. He was just like, he goes, you're a unique client, man. He like, you, you come at it from a different perspective. And I'm like, I, I, I don't want to leave because I don't think there's any place else that I'd be as happy. And so for me, mm -hmm. the, 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 the desire is to live and die in the game and yep. to be buried here in fucking Humboldt. Amen. And, and it's that simple. And so once I, once I created the forever game, it makes it fucking easy because I'm going to fucking bury you through a war of attrition. Yeah. It's like, I got, I got all the hours in the day, bro. I'm gonna fucking get I don't you got there. any other things to do. I got not yeah. good at anything else. You know? No, like, no, I belong here and, and I'm happiest. And I think that now with the, the advent of um, acceptance, we have a different value too, where we become bridges from the past into the future especially for us that have gone through these transitions and to allow people to understand like what was the, the, the tone, what made this occur? Why, why were these things popular? What were people doing? Mm -hmm. So you were able to take the information and use it because we cut it all out. Yeah, and the next, the next major explosion is going to be legalization mm -hmm. and like full national because well, I mean, yeah, yeah that's, go ahead, I mean, go ahead. When, you know, when you look at, look at some hardware companies right now, that are doing two hundred million dollars a year, that are essentially able to 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 build and grow off of our industry in multiple states. How legalization has worked and the availability of hash and the life of it, and and praise them, no question whatsoever. But our, I feel like our real big move is going to be once national legalization comes. For some of us, it may not even be. I don't think yourself personally, because I think you're already so well set up in what you're doing, but for some other people, for some of these other guys that have been here for a long time, they're going to get pulled into larger companies that are legitimizing. And, and it's almost the same thing. Like you were saying about cookies. It's like, don't feel ashamed because you've evolved to a point where you're an asset for a major company, you know? And, and I, I did that with advanced nutrients and was like, well, fuck, okay. I'll learn how to be, an, I'll learn how to be a, a an executive. Okay. And you go and you have to have that experience to learn. And I see so many guys and I've seen it through the years, especially from Oakland to, to even forward. Now mm -hmm. look at how many fucking kids Kev that are running these companies now that are in some ways so successful doing so fucking good. I, I can't be more, more stoked for them and be more happy for them. But what's going to happen next is once nationalized legalization comes a kid like Jay who owns professor Sift 
can now distribute a product nationally out mm-hmm. of a place like California. You know, a guy like, uh, you know, like some of our, you know, Adam from, you know, Simply Adam. Some of these guys are so fucking talented. And they've, but they've built these companies, they've built these brands. And that national push for a guy like yourself, for a guy like the smaller guys, is going to be this next major, I mean, that's going to be the next tech money explosion. I mean, it's oh, going to be yeah. insane. Yeah, that'll be that'll be the next time the investors dig deep in the pockets. Right now is a tough one. You better have a good business plan. You want to pull money. That's you know that's we just re-roofed and there's Wonderland. Some great stuff. We Where just we re- yeah, we just re-roofed Wonderland. So oh, I thought the yeah because I had the manufacturing license there for four years just chilling, and we were waiting to get the distro and the processing license, and it took four years for the county to wrap their head around the complexity. <laughs> it's oh, wow. it's cannabis permitting. But we just got the soft stamp on all of it, so the new roof is in, all the all the remodeling is going. But that's going to be a full blown vertical there too for for uh, bringing material in, processing it, and then manufacturing in solventless. And that's catering awesome. to uh, smaller growers in the area. That yeah, that's so we can have a we have, we want to be able to use it as really as like a brand. I want to say like a brand builder where we have an ability. To, in the old days, what what the, what the beauty of Wonderland was wasn't that you could get clones. It was that you could ask, you could access me, who was somebody who was figuring out what was hot in fucking Detroit and Georgia and in Alabama and in Florida. So wherever your product was ending up, I knew what was hot that was wanted, right? So what I would mm-hmm. do is I would collect those things. So my collections always represented geographical money. So when people came in, you could talk to me in my office and I'd be like, where's all your weed going? They'd be like, it moves to Boston. And I'd be like, all right, I know what's hot in Boston. And we would load you up. And so what it did is it allowed people to basically just come in and say, Kev, what should I grow? Mm -hmm. And when we did the numbers on it, you know, over a four year period, we influenced about a billion dollars in herb production. And it was successful because of the way I went about it. And so what I know is that it's the same thing now. What you want is you want the farmer not to have to be a fucking market predictor. The farmer should be able to put their efforts into farming. And there should be an ability to sit down with some people who say, listen, when we run through our fucking data, these are where there's opportunities to fill. These things are dangerous to fill. So let us move you into things that are good to fill. And then let us use an, an in-house situation. Because once we get the appellations in play, everything has to be in Humboldt for it to happen. So now you're able to have a vertical piece that lets us tie in to do appellation work. And so right now it'll be machine trim hand polish because at the price point nobody's fucking hand trim let's be honest but when we get back into appellation era then we can go into it but we had a hash lab laid out so that we can do a solventless because we know that that's really where the the product that should be moved out of the area should go i don't think flour should be shipped i don't think that it moves well with vibration i don't think you can really move flour so delicately around that it if we have problems moving it you know from fucking distro to store Imagine shipping it to another country. So I know we got herb coming from Portugal to Israel, the Israeli operations, right? But the bottom line is to me, it's concentrate that should be shipped and flour should be local. Mm-hmm. Flour has a limited shelf life. Concentrate has a fucking indeterminate shelf life. Done correct. The future of hash production on large scale is exactly the model of break it down from fresh frozen into water hash. And then store that water hash and press to order. And that's going to be, and that's what, I mean, look at Heritage, look at so many guys that are so smart at how they've managed it. And then that's how that it's that adjustment that then is enables you, enables you to be able to scale. Exactly. Otherwise you can't store pressed rosin. It's, no, it's no, it starts to, it Keep starts it to fucking, the, it starts to layer. Exactly. We can't, exactly. we can't, we can't break. Once we have that product from the wash, we can hold that. Yep. But you can't hold flour. And so, I mean, it's it's the amount. I mean, my son, my son works at a distro. I think you know, he was telling me like well, fuck, a couple months back. He goes, yeah, it was a brutal week. He goes, I had to return 6,000 pounds this week. And so flour just doesn't hold well and, and no matter what we do. And so to me, flour markets should be craft, local markets. And then you have large scale production to cover your low price points. But for like the Emerald Triangle, our our value really is in resin quality. Yeah, it's like hashes, champagne, flowers, beer. Yes, yes. And what's yes. Sam the Skunk Man say? Um, flower is for women and slaves. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> you know, we sh- he's coming. Do you know what I just found out? What's funny as shit, he just emailed me. He's coming to the U.S. and he's going to be here for like a couple weeks or something. Um, oh, I don't know what his, I'm not sure what his window is when he's here, but he's going to be in the U.S. and uh, Dave's going to be in the U.S. for a little while. So. Yeah, because he and I have only talking over the, the Internet. I've never I've never spoke to him on a, he always wants to do FaceTime and shit. Mm-hmm. And we've chatted a couple times. But the thing is, you know, with a lot of the guys that are legends, like Neville used to hit me up too. What I just really want is conversation with them. And, yeah. and that's what I get because I don't want any of your shit. It's like, I really, I never go after anybody. Anybody who's known for something, when we, we hang out, I don't go there. Yeah. So whatever you're known for is I leave you alone. And that way, when we're hanging out, you can kind of just be you. And yeah. it, it, it's, it's, it's nice. I was hanging out with uh, Eva from Radio Ridge and Jord. We were having lunch and Eva was laughing. And she's like, did you need any plants? And she looks at me and she's laughing. She's like, yeah, I probably not. And I said, no, I was going to ask you the same thing, but I know you don't need them either. And since neither one of us need any plants, neither one of us are asking for any fucking plants. So we can actually hang out and have lunch. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And yeah. you know, it's, 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 which is, it's all good. People have desires, but a lot of times, you know, it's, it's what you learn about what, what it must be like to be a pretty girl where everybody's really coming at you for something specific and it's not what you want it to be. You have no real value. No. It's just what you hold. What's yep. uh, what's your advice? How does your advice differ for craft farmers in California today versus three years ago? You know, it doesn't really differ very much. My 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 point has always been the same, that if you're craft, you cannot be in the lane of commercial. So to me, if you're running Gelato 41 from Connected and you're running Gelato 41 on your craft farm, you confuse the customer because you give them a fucking option. Mm-hmm. So you can't give them an option. Craft farmers can have no options. They they have to be able to be in a situation where the only way you can touch that product is through them. And what they're doing is they're selecting things that have the absolute best impact on their location, yep. meaning that they can create the absolute best product. And then that's the only thing you can function on as a farmer, because as a small farmer, when you start trying to chase a trend, by the time you get into it, you're already like at the zenith of it. And all you're Mm going to do now is get diminishing returns from that point forward. So I never see it sharp. And I just think that in general for the farmers, what you have to be able to do is also recognize that if you grew a thousand pounds last year and you had a fucking shell, 400 of them, don't grow a thousand this year, grow fucking 500. I'd rather have a hundred less sold than a hundred that I had to throw away because yep. I had to put a hundred fucking pounds of effort out. And, and that's, what's taking place is people aren't really realizing it. And so for me, I just shut the fucking farm down altogether because if I put the 700 hours in on the farm that it takes me to run it from spring to fall, I don't have the ability to do any other work. And since I don't get paid enough from the farm to disregard the other work, it's really about where are you going to get fucking paid? Mm-hmm. And so to yeah. me, shelving the farm and just holding the asset and letting it sit and not emotionally dying with it is a better choice. And then what it does, it lets you take on other opportunities like, you know, like messing around with the Australia crew. Mm -hmm. That was my next question. I'd Mm -hmm. love to get into you doing some really cool work out in Australia. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, no, I'm hella juice, man. I get to work in, I get to work in a bunch of countries so far and they're all really the same. They're they're to help the country develop, their 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 model to where people come in and say hey can you help us kind of understand how to go from here to where we want to be and i'm 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 not a consultant and i usually don't even take the loot i try to go after equity with the company if it's the right company so it allows me to be really fucking selective so what it does it allows me to have companies like pursue me and then if i like you as a person where like you you make me feel um confident that you if anything goes wrong you fucking taking a beating i like that where if it goes south one of your fingers is gone too i can fuck with you <laughs> i like that part and so Share i have to feel that or otherwise i don't want to fuck with you at all because if you walk away and the thing tanks you stole my time and so i i get exposed to some really interesting people and because they have to court you a little bit to get you in there you get to see him pretty good. And so I got fortunate that I got to get some exposure like that. And I get, I I talked to a group in Australia a while back and, and their, their consultant, really nice young dude. 
I help him out and I'm just trying to give him some assistance. And I said, listen, I said, what you need right now is just some friendship. Like, give me an hour with you and your team. I said, I won't charge you. Let me just lay out like a strategy. So you have a fucking plan. And he just came at me. Right. And so they go forward and they ended up not doing the project. But a year later, he hits me up with another group and he says, Hey, this group wants to bring you in to do something interesting. And this group has the ability to do something that's fantastic, which is really put a lot of stores in Australia with support behind them and a true Australian love where they love the culture of Australia. And so there's this unique feel of we don't we're not trying to bring California into Australia. We we want to be able to create Australia and have it touch California. So when they when they got a hold of me to talk about resurrecting the old varieties from the the seventies that you know were legendary about uh, that time period, the Mullumby Madness and you know the history of Neville. And I said, hey, I know the crew. I knew Neville um, not directly, but we used to communicate you know via email, and I know a lot of his old team. So let me try to dig up the genes. And I found out, you know, where their genes were held and I got the genes sent out. And then I started um, digging up uh, heritage cultivators in Australia that could then tie in with the company so they can start doing the same thing we try to do here, which is start to merge the, the traditional with the new regulated. So you can start to be able to create the inroads and allow the people that are heritage to produce products, introduce genes. And we were able to, uh, I thought that a cookies relationship would be solid there because I could see that the companies were solid. When I was Israel, it was the same thing. I got brought out to Israel to look at the operations. And I realized that because they were so socially adept, that it, a, a, a franchise merger would probably be a smart option. So I have nothing to do with it other than I connect you. But it's that I've connected them into Israel, which gave them 11 stores. And I connected them into Australia, which gave them seven. So 18 cookie stores came out of those two connections. And what it does, it allows you, like I said, to be able to start bringing the, that publicized heat to get the attention and then use it to develop the other components. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just juiced because I just love the team from Australia, man. They couldn't be a better bunch of people. And they have a really comprehensive plan and they they brought in some incredible herbalists and pharmacy groups because you have to have like a pharmacy model in Australia, kind of like Israel. And so it allows us to bring in people that I know from the medical world where I can introduce them into Australia. So now we can start getting good current information into Australia. We can start introducing operators and players into that world so that they can start building their situation from scratch, but with good information. And the ability to legitimatize their industry, just like us, where our heritage group created the modern industry. And, and, and what we're doing here is we're trying to step on it and pretend like it didn't happen when really you need to embrace it and, and celebrate it because it's the, it's the cultural component. It's kind of like the Wild West, where the Wild West is odd in the sense that it was fucking genocide you're celebrating. But for 19 years, the West existed and then it disappears. And Buffalo Bill and Annie Oakley and Sitting Bull, they all realize they don't want to see the culture disappear. So they create that Wild West traveling show that was so successful. It brought the Wild West into the mainstream. And when you talk to people about how long the Wild West lasted, I get people saying 100 years. It was only fucking like 19 from after the Civil War to when cars come out. What they did is they captured the culture yeah. and allowed the, the fantasy of freedom so they wash the genocide away and they bring forth the positive. And for us with cannabis and what we did is you have to allow the freedom of the American pioneer to come forward as cultivators. And the same with Australia, the same with every country that has people who did heritage work. You got to let that shit shine because it adds fucking flavor to the drink. It just Absolutely. makes it taste better. 100 percent, man. Couldn't agree. So Secret ingredient. Truth. Truth. You're doing, besides that and all the other things we were talking about, you're also doing a number of projects in the Web 3.0 space. True, the Metaverse um, Project. I'd love for you to talk to the community and the listeners about why you're allocating your time and energy to this specific area and why you think that this specific area is, is good for our community. You know, the, 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 the digital world is really the playground most people live in now. 
as funny as it is, it's like everybody's like, they don't want their kids touching the, you know, I don't want my kid touching the computer as a kid. And I'm like, well, you fucking better because they're going to be living there. And so the 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 metaverse is scary to us, to me, the same way the, the Internet was scary to us, where I remember when the Internet came out and I'm like, what is this thing? And I'm like, who the fuck would want to buy books online? And then I remember the, the headline that said Bezos is an idiot and Amazon's going bankrupt. And then you got fucking social media. Who would want to connect online? What, what's, what's the value of data? And then you got fucking Zuckerberg, right? And so what you have is this, this developmental wave in our lifetime that most of us just don't fucking quite catch that it's here. And so what we do is we wait till it's already fully adopted before we believe in it. And then we jump in and it's already fucking been monetized. Yeah. So what I know is that since I was able to see the rise of the dot-com world in the Bay Area when I was selling drugs to people who were making that money, and I was lamenting that I had no computer skills, and then I get into the social media world, and I'm not a social media person, really. I was private my whole life. And then I'm just like, oh, wait a minute. Web 3.0 is, is, is the ability for us to link all forms of engagement and to also bring in some interesting attributes that, to me, have a value that have to be brought forth. You must create a value in cannabis for people who don't smoke. Mm -hmm. So for people who don't consume cannabis, what do you do? You create the ability for speculation on varieties. You create the ability for people to gamble on, does a variety fucking reach a level of saturation in a market at what pace? So we use velocity as a calculator in anything because speed of movement through the system dictates the truth. If it's fucking flying, you know something's on. Mm -hmm. And so we can do velocity calculation and scrape metric data. And what it does, it starts to allow us to be able to get people interested in what's sold in cannabis. We can start to use the metaverse to create digital identities for ourselves that are fun and engaging so that people who want escapism can jump into your world for a little while and go take an education where they spend fucking five minutes with Jameson learning about what Jameson does. And we get we get a five minute discussion with Addison on something that Addison wants to fucking talk about that you wouldn't get from that same level of introspection if you weren't getting it. People fucking need this and they want the escape. I escape by looking at people shoe fucking horses. I'm fascinated by fucking shoeing horses. Like that shit just kills me. I'm like, wow, it's a craft. These fucking guys are masters with that knife. And like they know how to kill the fucking <laughs> horse. Fascinated by that shit, man. I'm the, the fucking horseshoer. And so once everybody found out I was fascinated by horseshoeing, everybody was in, sends me horseshoeing fo photos now. It's, I'm like, I'm not that fucking obsessed. But I'm obsessed because it's, it's two or three minutes of escape into art. And what I realized is that the when I looked at NFTs and I started seeing what everybody was doing with NFTs, I'm like, oh, this is like Crypto Kitty and fucking like Beanie Babies and shit. It's novelty items that'll be hot, then they'll blow away. And so once you have enough of these fucking gorilla cookies that you're showing, they're, not, they're no longer uh, unique. And so NFT non-fungible means no replacement. And what we're creating is these little subtle fucking shifts, but ultimately all very similar. And so the novelty wears off, where's the long-term value? So when I started really looking at it, I realized that NFTs are really, they're, they allow you to escape a brokerage house if you're in art. It allows mm -hmm. us to be able to take and promote products and sell. It's almost like self-publishing your, your um, literature. So it allows you to get material into the public that otherwise wouldn't be allowed to be seen because just like Herb, if the distributor doesn't want your fucking weed, it doesn't move. That doesn't mean the store doesn't want it. The distributor controls the decision. And if the farmer could talk to the store, you'd see a far more efficient transfer of product. But because you have a brokerage house in between, they have to make sure they manage their end. And managing their end means a margin. And that margin precludes there from being access. So the NFT allows you as a cannabis individual to be able to start to look at what you do as art and to be able to start to create batches as art and to have them as unique components that you can then bid and move as a batch so that you're able to get a hype on a product so that you then have an ability for a distributor to want to fuck with it. Because um, what's the best example? What just won the Emerald Cup, right, was a 14.5, right? 
So that thing comes in, it tests at 14.5. I fucking challenge you to sell that in California. I don't give a fuck what award it won. Sell that shit. The distributors won't touch that with a fucking pole. Wouldn't touch it. I don't give a fuck. 26 is the number. Otherwise, they got to tell a story and you got to convince people that the Emerald Cup is the fucking Academy Awards of weed and all this other shit. When that's not really what you need to do to sell drugs. Drugs sell themselves. And so the problem is that that 14.3 will not fucking move through normal distro. And it was considered the best smoke at the Emerald. The NFT would allow you to get around that because you'd be able to mint that whole fucking thing as that whole batch and the product as a package and then do bid lot on it and access and use the NFT to be able to capture it, blockchain to fucking pay it, and the metaverse to fucking create the identity for it. Well, also make it impossible to knock off. Yes, it, you you unless they do a, unless they do a simultaneous block, but who the fuck is going to really try to block a fucking bag of weed? There's far more valuable blockchains to fucking get into than a than a distro pack on weed. Yeah. But the point is the ability to utilize it, and then also what I realized is that so much of what we are is like when people talk about they want to hear the stories. I always read people's stories, and I'm laughing, and I'm like, oh, man, come on, tell the real fucking story. Talk about the time, like my buddy was telling me, like. The time he was so fucking high on heroin that he was wearing a fucking colander on his head because he believed that it would keep the fucking helicopters from seeing his heat signature. So he's got a metal fucking colander on his head. And he's telling me this story. This was Humboldt in the day, you know, when, and, and I'm cracking up because all the, the drugs were rampant and all the crazy fucking shit. But those are the stories that really resonate because they let yeah. you see who the fuck was really doing this. And every time I hear these sterilized vanilla stories, I'm like, oh, Christ, come on. Somebody admit they like fucking money. Somebody admit they got high, please. Well, whether they always start those off are the ones with, that sell. They always start off with like, you know, so and so got sick, and then I. You know, yeah. Like, you're not a fucking healer, bro. Like no. you're a fucking. I get it because I like, I wanted a better looking fucking girlfriend, and I was poor. I I didn't <laughs> like that. I was. It was funny. I came from fucking money. But my family wouldn't give me any like so like I was always forced to generate my own cash. Mm -hmm. And so I was always constantly having to make money. And what I realized was that drug dealers had a better time and they had better looking women. And I was like, I want that. I want more time and to be happy and to have better looking women. Like to me, when so I said that to someone, they were horrified. They were like, oh, my fucking God. That's I was like, that's such a bad motivation. What the well, people fuck, don't you like know? people don't like the truth, you know, because no, like I was you said so earlier, 12. it's I'm fucking it's 12. social what media. <laughs> yeah, it's like the social media age. It's the age right now where it's it has to be the perfect picture, and it has to be. And then look at, you know, look at this air of entitlement in, you know, this generation that that sort of feels like everything has to be completely perfect. And in the background of a picture, they want to zoom in and find the fucking the hamper with like. The brown stained underwear and fucking and then be like, oh, there you fucking son of a bitch. It's your like, flaw. Yeah. Well, they're, and they're, yeah, no. And, and I, what I noticed is like what I, what I was able to do is once I got popular in weed, what I realized was that if I just remained myself, then it would always be easy. And so ugly or fucking hairy or high or indifferent, like that's who the fuck you're going to get. And um, that way yeah. it's just I'm consistent. The same dude in so, person. Yeah, it's why I know who the fuck I am, so I never have to worry about it because it's just that. But I, I'm also old, so I'm grateful that I'm not 20 having to live under that social media fucking microscope because it's real for them people. No. Oh no, it's it's there's no shortage of like DMs blasted with like 20 something year olds that are just sort of fucking you know, but there's that. Then there's also in in the uh the the pursuit of this false happiness, you know, that's so physical, that's so like uh, material driven. It's, and and I, I'd have to say too, I'm, I'm, I'm not uh, innocent of it myself. I mean, I grew up, you know, in the generation behind yourself, you know, but, you know, about 10 years, it's like, and you could see those different things, but it, it is tough right now to see um, where, you know, the Mylar bag chasing, uh, you know, yeah, you know, but the lean, lean is probably my least favorite part of all of it is that you see this like there's this sort of coolness of having 
uh, you know, of, of drinking lean while you're smoking blunts and you're doing this other shit. And it's just like, dude, that's heroin. Yeah. Like yeah. Fucking no, drinking well, heroin that, soda. We're a heroin culture now though, brother. We're like uh, this fentanyl shit's out of control, but we, we did yeah. it. We did it with meth too. I saw it with methamphetamines where as a child, meth was a legal prescription drug given to your family for weight control and stimulation. And every motherfucker in America was on some kind of fucking diet aid. Then they get rid of it, and all you see is meth everywhere because people were addicted to it. Then I watched the whole opiate outbreak where, like, hey, here's here's a non-addictive time-release thing called fucking Oxy, and you can mm-hmm. refill this as often as you need forever. Yeah, and they created a, an opiate level of addiction that's mind-bending. And right now in Humboldt, we're having people die every guy. I mean, every fucking couple of days is people dying from from fentanyl overdose. It's nonstop Jeez. now. Yeah, we've we've we've. You created a situation where you got people, um, you, you got a, a, a nation of heroin addicts. Yeah, it's almost a form of population control, if you think about it. Oh, completely. It's, it, it's most <laughs> definitely a way to keep their, to me, it's competition control. When you can create a situation where you can make money off of people and keep them from being competitive, that's not a bad place to be. Where I can, yeah. I can keep you as a worker slave and you're, and you're feeding the criminal justice system too. Ooh, you're valuable. Kev, did you did you see this the the popularity of solventless rising the in the way it did in the last five years, and and how much do you think the price of pounds has to do with the increased popularity in solventless in the California market? Well, well, a little both. The, the thing with the the change in the solventless with the Cali market was once once butane went out and and and, and what, it, what it's kind of like a, a truth of in order to get a butane license for hydrocarbon extraction, the facility has to basically be a fucking bomb facility. And so the cost of a hydrocarbon facility versus a solventless is fucking radically different. It's insane. Yeah. And once they were able to really start to get dabbable solventless, once you started to be able to use the rig, because remember like when, when, when BHL first comes out, Jameson, there is no dab rigs, right? Well, what I do is I go to all these blowers and say, listen, I, I brought in all these bongs and I said, these are all the different types of smoking devices. I need things that fit these fucking tubes. And I had to make everything. And when you came into my shop, you could bring in your gear and convert it to a fucking brig. Because I knew that if you couldn't smoke it, you wouldn't be able to appreciate it. Right? So I was able to create that initial thing. And then others took that from me and then turned it into glass shops in Humboldt County. But we were the first ones to do that. It's just that I didn't want to be a glass shop. I just needed you to be able to smoke the drugs I wanted to sell you. So once we con- once we created the ability to, to get access to a smokable tool, the explosion happened. And then once once we got into hash, just like, you know, Nika was talking about, they had the screen. I remember the screens and you'd be able to kind of volatize it and stuff. But the bottom line is people wanted to be able to melt because in their mind, the melt is the quality, not necessarily the high. The high is not, it's just like with visual cannabis and Instagram. The fucking quality of the high is second to the wow factor in the picture. And it's, it's, it's the whole thing. It's, it's the it whole is, it moves, but you know what I mean? Like, but for a lot of people, the visual is more important right now. It's kind of like with, with, with looks. You're a woman that loves beautiful men. That's all you care about. It's a beautiful man. A lot of other fucking factors you overlook. And it's yeah, the same it's thing with anything visual. Feel. Yep, yep. It's, how it's, it makes it's, you feel it's, like a, 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 the, right, the right strain at the right time in the right piece of glass with the proper banger, capped correctly, heated correctly, and timed correctly. When you exhale that, oh, it's you heaven. Fucking, you're like Charlie Brown dancing around. Yeah, it, you're fucking so there's, there's a lot of people who if you said, listen, I'm going to give you this rosin, it's going to be black and look horrible, but it's going to be the best thing you've ever tasted in your life. Or you said, or I have this really nice looking rosin that's not that flavorful. There are a lot of people that would take that nice looking rosin because they need that Instagram picture. They, they, that's what I'm saying is that there's a problem. They don't want to have like, to justify the truth. No, and no. Like, and each individual makes it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah and, and we all we all we all know our own truth. It's just that for me, that's why I don't tell you what you should and shouldn't do. I just know for myself though that I'm consuming the product for the drug effect. That what I want is the the impact from that 
thing. And, and it, it's what, it's what allows me to fuck around with equatorial cannabis. It looks like shit. Cause what yeah. I know is I, I want yeah. the cannabinoids and the other metabolites. I'm not worrying about what it looks like. Yeah, strip, strip the actus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you see solventless continuing to grow in the California market? Like in Canada right now, as a snapshot today, you cannot build a legal uh, solventless company based on bringing grams of rosin to market because there's not a large enough consumer base purchasing wow. rosin in Canada. There's not here either. Not here. I don't think here either. I don't think that you can function as a rosin company right now either because the problem is, is that it, what, what, what happens is in order for you to be craft rosin, we got to talk about like $85, $90 retail. Right. Because the bottom line is, what are we talking? Fucking two, three percent pull total off the unit. So by the time we're done extracting, like what are we really getting from a pound? What is it really bringing forward? That amount is fucking expensive. So in order for me to justify it, I have to be in that upper price tier. And the problem with California. So like, let's just say let's go. Let's just say for the next two years, it's a fucking problem because what you have is is people with no money and an overpriced product. Let's move into national to where we can open up our consumer base. And now we have the ability to be in that rosin world where I could, I could sell my, my acre of canopy as rosin, because I know I have enough people around the world willing to spend 80 bucks, but in but California, you because of the black market. Stores. Yes. And, and so few stores, That's safety valve. You're geographically set so you can't really probe areas and get bottom line is there's too many of us trying to fill too small a hole. But it's I happening think that, though, like Punch and mm -hmm. some of these other guys are doing it because they're figuring out supply chain and, and access to material at a lower cost. And mm -hmm. then they're scaling up and doing that production. Punch is a really good one. There's some of them that are doing it and the price is Where starting they to- Where did they stop? Where's Punch? How are they market? doing it, Addy? The way, just, just how I said, so what they're doing now is, you know, over the last two years, you had like, you know, you had fucking the farming situation got crazy with the flower sale product, you know, the, the market for selling flour. So you had guys that came in and they were like, oh, just freeze that shit and we'll sell it to, to solventless because that's what they make water hash out of. And, and they sold that shit to farmers. Well, it happened enough times where it pissed farmers off because the material didn't sell. And these dudes drove themselves out of the market. Well, then you had a bad taste in the mouth of the farmer. And then it, and then it sort of needed to change. It needed to get, a, you need to sort of correct that thing. So what happened was, is when the new companies are coming in, like Verde, Verde comes into California, right? First idea in Verde's head is, well, we're going to fucking get the farm and we're going to lock up deals with farms. Verde does it. Next thing you know, the fucking fires happen, blows out all their supply. So now Verde has to sit there and source from the market. Well, when a large company has to source from the market, but the market's not built in a correct supply chain for them to get into, what the fuck do they do? They all have these, uh, you know, a guy in their company, they call their procurement specialist who fucking looks into the market. And he's pretty much looking at a list of fucking farms and he's calling them and being like, hey, do you have fresh frozen material? But the infrastructure is not in place yet. So it was a, it's a staggered approach where now because the flower market dipped again, the farmers were like, fuck this, I'm gonna invest in the infrastructure and I'm gonna have some fresh frozen in place so that now when these guys are coming and the guys that are surviving are the ones like punch and shit, they're coming in and they're being like, oh, I can buy up all this fresh frozen and they're smart. They're waiting for the, they're waiting for the connoisseur shit to get sold off and the farmer to sit with it. And then they come in and buy it all off at low price and now I can put out a lower cost fucking rosin and mm -hmm. I, or I can do tier one, tier two, tier three, which they all picked up off of uh, 710, which they brought out from Colorado. And that's first press, second press, third press. And those third presses can now, of course, now have a lower cost. So that's really how, and rosin, I, I think 710 has been one of the greatest ones at it. Rosin tech's another one because rosin tech is an interesting one. They fetch one of the highest prices but from what I heard, they, they sell a lot in like San Jose, which is like the tech area, you know? So they distribute to these certain areas that will pay a higher price, and mm -hmm. th but they don't see a ton of high volume. But then it was huge for them to just win, you know, at Emerald Cup. But mm -hmm. anyway, the way that the guys are adjusting is that they're figuring out 
that there is a supply chain in place that they can lean on and they can get material at a lower cost. And what's also revolutionizing that whole thing is what we just talked about before. Over the last two years, there's been a major revolution in these genetic breeders for hash production and those genetics are getting out now. And those, so now from what you just said, you know, a, a two, 3%, fuck a two, 3%. If, if it's hot and it's crazy, you can deal with that. Otherwise, there's fours, five, sixes. Mm -hmm. You know, GMOs hitting five, six fucking percent consistently. There's these other ones that you can pull in. And now if GMO is going to bulk, I can take the the 1.8 producer or the 2% producer, do a modified, and then start putting that out. And, you know, when you look at the most successful company in the black market, look at West Coast Alchemy. They do a very good job of their marketing and what they do and trilogy. And, you know, these guys are winning the, the 710, uh, uh, what's it, when they had like the, you know, the, the, the categories for selection on. Yeah. The most popular brands. Much mm -hmm. Yes. You know, it's like they're winning the marketing game. And, but then when you look at their product, it's a mix match of, of what's in the market that's then being modified with what I mean is like some of it is a, not even a strain name. It's actually, you know, coming from a, a, a product that they take, uh, this strain and that strain and blend it together and they press it. So my point is, is that it's diversifying how you can put product out, how you can take a 1% and turn it into a, a profitable sale product because you can mix it with the 4%. And this shit's happening and it has been. And it's and I think it is like I see the price getting lowered. I see it, you know, turning into this uh, into and look at the two largest growths, the pre-roll with rosin in it and the vape cart with rosin. Those mm -hmm. two are the largest growth sectors. So what, what's happening is it's a much more sophisticated infrastructure around supply chain that's happening, you know, and, and there's, 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 those things are happening. And I think that that's going to really boost it. But again, national is what we need. You know, we no. can survive here and have fucking fun. This is going to be great. But national is when the top blows off the son of yeah. a bitch. And, and that's when, I mean, when we're shipping fresh press to the East coast and they're getting it on the, on the, on the day that it fucking that it turns into really good stuff, you know, like they, they'll be searching it out. There's only there's only 200 grams coming. It's gonna be fucking turning by the time it gets to you guys. You know, it's like that's that's where I think it's gonna be happening at some point, or where it gets distributed when when a place like Oklahoma is able to buy California hash, mm -hmm. right? And and maybe maybe now we're gonna start to see that Appalachian thing really come into play because. The best shit, the, the dudes who are making the most money are going to want the best shit. They already have it now because of the black market, right? You know, you, you can't fuck with that. But once the legalization fully happens and that stuff's everywhere, that means we're all making money everywhere, which is, you know, that's. Kevin, Kev, what do you think about CBD, like solving the CBD? Like, do you think that that's going to be a big thing? Like me personally, like I think that when we can offer dabs to people that otherwise couldn't dab, for whatever reason, um, like for example, my dad, like if I could offer him the dabbing experience with, uh, I don't, the word is not non-psychoactive, but a, a, a low psychoactive, a low psychoactivity. Low yeah, to a degree. I think it'd be a small niche. I think it's an interesting okay. way to expose people because the mouth is phenomenal. But ultimately, mm -hmm. if we're talking about CBD in general, you're, you're, you're looking at it from a different perspective. And I think there's easier ways to get loaded on cannabinoids in that direction yeah and so it's like the non-alcoholic beer of, uh -huh. uh, of the rosin world is what it would be mm -hmm. and it, it it allows people to be part of the crew which is cool i just don't see it as it, it's kind of like when everyone said to me everybody's gonna be smoking hemp cigarettes and i'm like well um, where the fuck are they right now um hemp just, like shit it didn't fucking get me high i'd throw it away and i'm telling you cigarette people are not gonna throw a fucking cigarette away it, it no. when you uh, I'm not a cigarette smoker, but what I know is cigarette smokers have a fucking relationship with the stick that is unique. Oh, they and put so, it out, slide it up their ass. They keep it for later, man. They, they don't keep it around, man. They, yeah, <laughs> they're carrying up the nostril and they'll hail it if need be. They need that thing. And so I think that it'll be a niche. So I think that what we'll have as we go forward, just like Addison's saying, is once we blow the top off this, you'll get the differentiation you need so the lanes open up. Right now, we're trying to stuff all the same shit into the same lane. Yeah. And because the store, especially in California, you don't have enough storefronts. And a lot of the stores are being vertical. You even got all the ones in 
You know, you got Glasshouse picking up that that whole chain that got caught up in that was that San Luis Obispo fucking scandal. Yep. And so, and I don't fault them. It's just grabbing operations. It's just that when you are a massive operator and you're carrying a lot of fucking stores, there's no ability for people to enter those stores as a as an as an alternate product choice. Mm-hmm. You can basically fill the you entire selection store from your micro brands. Yeah, because you got, you know, five million, seven million square foot of canopy. You can create a lot of fucking brands that are all you that look radically different, but they're all you. Well, the and rest I, of the world's going on. The market's going on. It's like mm-hmm. burn, burners marketing. Burn, you know, these things are happening. And if you, yes, I've always I've always I've always thought it was hilarious for these guys who have this ultra vertical integration mentality. It's like, what the fuck are you doing? Like it, when you walk into Whole Foods, is it is it like that? No, it's it's a bunch of brands that are kind of some of them are coming out of nowhere, some of them are staples. It's all about health. It's all about you know. It, it's all about this whole lifestyle, and that's we have that same ability in our industry. And, mm-hmm. and I, I I think this is going to be bigger fucking money than oil. Oh, it's, it's going to be fucking thing. crazy. Yeah, well, the applicability of it's supernatural, and so and, it's like gas. Yeah. And it's gas and you use it every day. It's the same yes. fucking thing. It's like you don't put it in your car, you put it in you, which then goes in the car. C- cannabis is so widely used. It's the number one fucking stress reliever in the entire world. And it will be, you know, and, and to us on our level, we get to expose people to the quality of some of these products like this, you know, like some of this hash, some of this glass, some of these different things. And 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 never mind also be able to educate them on what the original stuff was and where it all came from. So then they can have an understanding of the whole story when somebody is like, Hey, we just genetically modified all of the fucking 16, you know, weeks sativas into eight weeks sativas. They know what that means. They understand what that's about, you know, and they can, they can understand that story and be a part of this entire industry as, as a, as a brand, but then also as like a fucking, it, it's a lifestyle. They could be yeah. in it and there's a it's space for, for everyone. You know, it is it's, for it's every cultural person. threads. It's cultural threads. That's why that's why the cookie shit is funny. But like it's he's really a lifestyle brand who got into cannabis. Yep. You know, and, yep. and it's it's and that's what I know is that no matter where the fuck I go, I see somebody wearing a cookie shirt. No matter what airport I'm fucking in, somebody's wearing a cookie shirt. Yeah. Well, and I the, because the... I'll see in the I'll see them with my name on it, like the Humboldt version, because you, you, they 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 personalize it to where you can only get certain gear at certain places, yep. right? So everything that's Humboldt is only sold in Humboldt. And I laugh and I'm like, that person has no fucking clue anything about it. They just know that's culturally relevant in their world. Yep. And I think Sun that is responsible for that too. Mm-hmm. And we need to be able to be those people that that allow that to occur still, where you 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 still allow people to enter the world. You know, I, I don't mm-hmm. I, I I don't I don't think the culture is dead at all. I think that it's just beginning. I think you're gonna you're gonna see this unbelievable influx oh. of people that'll be It'll, 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 whatever we did prior will look like nothing compared to what we see coming. What do you see? What do you see, man? Like, what, like, you know, uh, do you see the rise of, of more smaller events? Like, you know, Addison's doing legends. Um, do you see, like, I, f- I feel as though the, the larger corporate cups and, and the high times and the emeralds are, have, have become their own thing that is a much more commercial. Yo, yeah, oh, they're radically different. They're, they're not. They're they're a completely different entity. I believe that you're going to see these smaller events, especially tied through NFTs. So what it does, it allows you to be able to get special collections to get together. And in the NFT, you can even have special options to allow you to go, you know, get a tour over it it. at Mothership. You can get to spend fucking two Mm -hmm. hours with Addison, you know, blazing. Just Addison's going to sit down with you and let you smoke stuff he likes. And so what it does, it just allows people to be able to enjoy it differently. And I think that the, the smaller events allow an intimacy that you don't get at the bigger events. Mm -hmm. And I saw it with the regens where what you're getting is you're getting, you just need more of them and they need to be, if we could have more of them and a little, a little cheaper so that what you're able to do is get the, the, you know, you have some, I'm not saying everything has to be brought down in price, but there needs to be more events, more accessible. And then they kind of culminate with like master events, almost like tiers. Mm -hmm. Yep. So what you're able to do is have an evolution and then you have a primary event that's like your fucking big one. But you have all these small ones. And I think, you know, with the with the metaverse, because of the way you can work, you could do them globally. So yep. you'd be able to use your 
your digital platform to be able to search the world out for locations and venues and, and enough people who'd want to go and check it out. And in that area, you'd find an expert or a pro that would yeah. be interesting to gel the event around. And that way you put together events where you have somebody who's got some information that people want to hear and you get people together to socialize and enjoy each other's company and share genes and share techniques and ideas and start to really like weave the cultural appreciation of cannabis in the production capacity. That's why any place that does fucking homegrown um you know, the, with no home ground, like, all these fucking companies that are trying to ban people like that fucking pox on your house for that shit. They're too fucking dumb to realize that it actually is the opposite effect of what they fucking seek. Mm -hmm. That if you let the fucking people get into the goddamn thing, they'd end up buying some of your bunk from the store. But it, it's so it's just so fucking strange. But to me, that's that's what that's our world, though, is that's what we encourage. What do you think of the DEA just recently coming out? and saying that uh selling seeds cannabis seeds is legal oh i'm that? fucking ecstatic man there's a bunch of us about to blow up it's crazy. because what it does it allows there to be people to be able to come forward that have been doing this for a long time they just don't want to have to deal with the risk and what it'll do is it allow us to have what we want which is a genetic cornucopia because you got different levels of you have different levels of breeding right and so like just like with tissue culture and conventional prop it's about rollout times. And so if we do conventional seed lines using like genomic research and agronomic fucking direction, it allows you to get stabilized lines for large scale production. But the speed of turnaround and desire to chase will always remain with the small. Mm -hmm. Tissue culture propagation is the same thing where with tissue culture, you only see so many things propagated because it's about a nine month developmental time between getting the plant in, running it through the whole process, doing the stress test, making sure it scrubs, and then actually getting the release in production. So what happens is, is you have these limits in large scale production in ag that can't give, you can't get around it. They have a lane and you allow them to take the fucking lane. It's their lane. Our lane is in niche production and it's in exploring the exquisite and the weird shit that is all impact, but not agronomic value. And that's, that's what we need is we need all these small people. That's why I loved it when I went to Maine and Michigan and I got to see the tent revolution because that shit just made me fucking grin because it was, it was a regen world inside your basement. They were creating living soil systems that were producing product that was stellar. And I was so happy to see it because it let me realize that we were going to go into a world that we hadn't dreamt where when I met that one lady and she was saying, I, I learned how to, how to grow from, uh, uh, from, from Fumador, right? Yeah. That's where she got her genes from. Yeah. And she had never bought a bottle in her life. Yeah. She had only learned how to grow regenerative from the conferences. She bought the book, she created her own product. And then she went there to show him the weed. And it was so fucking pure yeah. that it let me see that that's the future that I really dream for. And I think that as long as you're being cool in the way you are, you'll attract those people. Yeah. It's, it's when you're a fucking pretentious prick that you drive away the participants that really can make the difference. And the adoption is what we need. You need, you need it because ultimately cannabis can be used for a million things. And even if you didn't consume it in any other way, but topically, it would change your life. So yeah. all you do is grow your plants in your yard and you distill them down with your little cooker and you take that infusion and put in some essential oils and some beeswax and some coconut oil and you got a yeah. anti-inflammatory rub. That's, that's the point. Cannabis belongs everywhere. It works on so many fucking levels, yeah, man. With low impact. That's what that's that's uh, Russo's whole thing. It's the most powerful drug with the least amount of side effects. Yep. So are you are you are you bullish on the next, you know, uh, let's just say twenty four months in California, or do you bearish. feel bearish, bearish brother? Bearish Bind on the hatch. Bind bearish on, on that motherfucker. Locked yeah. down. This is not the time to play. California yeah. is a fucking disaster. And I don't care what they do with the. I don't give a fuck what little bills they're putting in. You can sell at a farmer's market. If you sell two or three pounds at a farmer's market, you're fucking, you're, 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 you're ecstatic, right? So they allow you to do like 10 a year. So that's 30 fucking pounds. Well, you got 500 of them. The fuck do you do with the other 470? Mm -hmm. That's the problem is that 
they allow you these little these little concessions and they act like it's a big deal. And I'm like, yeah. what are you fucking doing? We're going to give you a break on the taxes. That's not the problem. I pay the fucking taxes. I need the goddamn price point to be fucking reasonable. And we yeah. need storefronts and we need we need distribution um, situations where this the number of people that have been fucked by distro is astronomical. Yeah. And so you you have such a catastrophe occurring that you're looking to me at two more years because all these bigger operations that are heavily leveraged, they're about to fucking start to come in. Look at you look at a couple, I'd say Flocan is the best example of the first tipping giant where they already tipped over and they've liquidated their facility. Mm-hmm. So they raised 185 fucking mil and they had they had global fucking dreams of domination. They got knocked the fuck right out of contention. So there's a whole bunch of these guys that are going to co- come next where I don't care if you spent 50, 70 fucking million on your infrastructure. If that shit isn't turning a profit, your fucking investors are going to get rid of you. And people misjudged the pace of return, the amount of return and the fucking sheer amount of product that they were going to have to compete with. So for me, the next two years is just let it fucking clean itself out and allow the system to do what it's going to do. And there's nothing you can do about it. I wish the small cultivator didn't have to go through this. But the problem is I'm not in a position to make those decisions in life. Yeah, I just yeah. have to accept it, too. And as a small cultivator, in terms of like so for me, like in terms of business, I don't think I'm small in business because I'm connected to so many operations. But I'm a small cultivator as a grower because that's what I personally fuck with. So for me, I still identify as that. And what I try to let the cultivators know is like, whatever you got to do, man, put the fucking farm on the table and go get a job. You'd actually do better and you won't lose your momentum emotionally. You can't hate the fucking craft. And if you go broke two, three years in a row, you're going to fucking be depressed and you, you, you can't be depressed. Only, only artists depressed that made me fucking money was Van Gogh. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I don't want to cut the fucking ear off to make that happen. Absolutely. Kev, are there yeah. any other other projects that you're working on? I know multiple people prior to this um, podcast reached out to me in the in the short amount of time we advertised it, asking um, about a seed line and if, if if anything was in the works there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We're, we're, I'm working on I'm working on some cool stuff. It's just that, you know what it is is for me is that I've worked on so many projects for so long. I never really did any of my own release work. I just was collaborative in projects and I provide genes into projects. And then I, I build mails to give to people. And when we went to do old wonderland, we were going to turn that into an inc- a breeder incubator because I had the nursery at one log and we were going to use wonderland. Cause what I knew was that all the people I was working with, none of them were going to get a license because uh, nurseries require commercial real estate. And so if you don't have commercial real estate, you fucked. And I knew that no one had it really. And so we figured that we would build the model and do the release and we would just do all the production and have the company come in and help steer the selection. So their, their direction was maintained and then it would allow us to do it. And I think that um, with the advent of the new seed pieces, a bunch of my friends came to me and said, Hey, we should start doing some work. And so I thought about getting together with a crew of my friends and starting to do some collaborative projects with them. And so we'll see some cool shit come out. But what we'll do is we'll release it through through the metaverse and through the NFT so we can have some some cool stuff to go along with it. Kind of like what we did with Josh. Yeah. Where we took that root beer um, chem dog special I got from Gene and Leo. And then I held it for all those years, just waiting for the right opportunity to break it out. And then when Josh said, hey, I have an idea and I want to do something at the regen, I want to do something cool. And I said, don't do something cool. Do something that's fucking sick. Let's put those let's put those root beer chem dogs out. Yeah, and I think what, what Josh did with having you know those genetics deployed to only the people who showed up to the con- to the region conferences, and then setting up those you know the Michigan uh, breeder forum, the Maine breeder forum, the Cali breeder forum, and really? then seeing what comes up. I, I just think more I of that. that. I think that's that's trailblazing shit. Like I think that's so cool. Yeah, no, because we have to get to work You're in that. Daddy. You got to be able to get many people to work together in a way that allows you to be able to just have some fucking fun. Yep. And and that's the whole point is that everybody gets so serious. It's just this whole thing, you know, grind every goddamn day. And I'm, I'm like, you can grind every fucking second and it still doesn't mean you're going to be fucking happy. It, it Grinding isn't necessarily what makes you happy. Grinding is a process to get to a point. 
but perpetually fucking grinding and working and moving. There's, there's got to be some joy. And cannabis to me was the yeah. joy where you, you got to say, you know what? It's Tuesday. Let's take the fucking day off and go hang out at the river. And he's go yeah. to the river all day and fuck with the dog. Yeah. Yeah. Well, gr- grinding's a mode, you know, it's, it's yes. a necessary, it's a necessary gear that you have to have in order to make this shit work. And that's, you know, like if you're not able to grind, if you're not able to relax, if you're not able to have that balance, you're not going to fucking make it. I mean, I, I think the one thing that, that, that you see kind of happening as well for a lot of guys in the industry is that their health, they're getting older. They're recognizing that without health, you can't enjoy this money. You can't enjoy this clout. You can't enjoy this fame. You can't enjoy any of this shit without health, without, you know, optimizing yourself as a person, you know, and I, and I think that's where rosin starts to come into our industry. Like the evolution of, of people in our industry in terms of a consumer, you always end up, you know, getting smarter and evolving and, and starting to realize that human optimization and cannabis really come together. And you can use cannabis in a way once you optimize yourself to even fucking do crazier shit and light, you know, and a level of enlightenment almost that can kind of occur in your productivity and other things. Like I love, I love when I still catch whispers of, uh, of people being like, Oh, cannabis makes you not productive. Cause I'm just like, are you out of your, you know, are you out of your fucking mind? Like cannabis will drive you mad in a way where you perfect <laughs> everything around you actually, or fight to it. And, you know, it just, it, 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 it'll draw that out of you. I mean, I've, I've said it and I say it all the time nothing has taken more from me and given me more in my life than cannabis. Nothing. Yeah. Not no. Another fucking thing that's taken more away and given more Yeah. in the blink of a fucking eye. It's cannabis. And it's, and that's why I'm very comfortable to say like that. This is my lane. This is where I'm going to stay. Like you said earlier, this is where I'm going to die. I'm not going to fucking go anywhere. You know, I, I love the web three component because it is the evolution of marketing. And it allows us and a community to use marketing in an industry that's that's fully, you know, a hundred percent fucking, you know, a, a, a click in what it is and how it is. And there's there's different cool little parts of it. Web three allows us to now take this to the next level to authenticate our product, to pr- to protect us from someone knocking it off, you know. But but I think the one thing we didn't talk about in this whole conversation that I think people, and, and, and we got to it, but we sort of jumped around it at the end there, was how, um, you know, the 800 pound mon- a gorilla, the, or the elephant, is the black market mm-hmm. in all of this. And, and every company, successful, every successful company, and I know it personally, every successful company out there is, is having to do some sort of a diversion, and, and it's just what happens, and the system is ripe metric is built so that you do have a a safety valve to do this thing i think the reason why some of these bigger groups that you were talking about failed is because they didn't they built their business in a way where um their safety valve meant high criminality you know it really went out it was like fucking embezzled you know they were like doing weird shit you know when you see these uh med men things and all these other fucking weird things um, that shit was like manipulation of markets and and other shit, you know, in, in order to for them, for them, because the money was so big and what they were doing, that was their way where it's like a brand in California, even some of the largest ones. Yeah, you do a little fucking, OK, move this bulk or do this or do that. And that shit's happening. And, and it's what do you think about that stuff? Like as a business owner, as a guy who's kind of in this or do you sort of do what I do and navigate in a way where you know you get to do business with everybody and that doesn't sort of affect you like what's what what are your thoughts on that well you know like you're gonna laugh but like when i ran the farm the like two years that i ran the farm i ran it like a legit biz right because i wanted to ask the fucking question could you actually run a fucking farm without (laughs) doing some side shit yeah and and after two years i went no and so for me it was it was a decision of putting the farm down because I didn't want to I didn't want to jeopardize the the seven years it took me to get the fucking license. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no. So a lot of it is is that you you know you don't want to jeopardize what you have, and I and so for me what I do is I went and looked for other other opportunities so that I would be able to put myself in a better situation where I wasn't having so much. Pressure. 
And what I know is that once you start to get prices down, that's, there's very few things that are really bought in the black market in America. Baby, baby fucking formula is hot right now, if you can believe that. Baby formula is hot in the black market. They're trapping baby formula. But once they get that fucking supply chain worked out, they won't be trapping it because there's no way you can do it. And so if we were in fucking Russia, you'd have a radically different black market economy because you have centralized production of products. And so the government decides what the fuck they want to produce and not the people. So there's always a shortage. And because of it, there's always a fucking black market. But here in America, we don't really have that much shit. Like I usually don't go pick up milk from the fucking black market milk maker. You know, I mean, in Rhode Island growing up, I mean, everything was hot. Shoes, clothes, pants, fucking new leather from, from the fucking, from the outlet. I mean, we had hot shit all the time. Like stealing goods was okay. But in our, in our new world, it's not so normal. And I just think that there'll always be a, a traditional market. But as soon as you go national and you start to get the, 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 the best shit for the cheapest price to where it should be, you got a fucking problem if you're in the trap. And that's what I always realized was that, and you can't predict when that'll happen. And so I just said, man, for me, I just don't, I just think it's too dangerous to try to take the trap out for too long because once it turns the corner, what are you going to do? And I just think that if you're traditional, enjoy what you have in front of you, but realize it cannot continue because as soon as you have national, they will clean this up. And what people don't catch is that once there's enough money involved in anything, money goes to the politicians and changes the fucking politicians. So if the politicians aren't positive, they fucking get replaced. The mm -hmm. money changes who makes the rules. And as soon as you start to open up the potential, because I remember I, I talked to Syngenta. Years ago, I had a fucking meeting with one of the lead scientists from Syngenta. And so we're hanging out. He was a killer guy too, right? Like fucking fascinating. But he and I are talking about is Syngenta in cannabis. And he goes, ah, oh, fuck no, we're not in cannabis right now. He goes, we're global food, Kev. He goes, we got the whole earth on our fucking food basket. He goes, we don't need to be in weed. He goes, but I'm going to tell you something. The day we enter weed, you will fucking know it. Because what it means is you got a global machine that can throw a million a day in R&D at a problem. And they got distribution down. They get everything science. down. They not, they not a market a product well. And what they really have at anybody is the communication with regulators. And so when you can communicate with the regulators, you dictate what's going to take place. And so as soon as we start to get cheap weed, cheap, and it should be, it, I mean, the truth of it is, is there should be herb for 10 bucks that's good pot so that people who are on limited budgets can afford to consume freely too. It, it should not be this exclusivity. Exclusivity should be re re reserved for fucking products that are Epicurean. And, and the box doesn't make that, nor does the, nor does the individual. Like the, the product itself dictates Epicurean. And that's really where, you know, like with me with the Gangier, it allows us to really be able to forge uh, an assessment of what is that. So that way what we have is the highest level shit and then the stuff that everybody can consume and should. And I don't want to wipe out the black market, but what I know is that it's just an inevitability because once you have acceptance, you no longer need to have it. If you're not in Russia where you're having centralized production, you shouldn't have any black market. The mm -hmm. market economy dictates what we do and what we don't do. Yep. And I think it exists because we aren't national. Exactly. You know, some of the if biggest brands the aren't. Once they yeah. are... It's going. And then once they are, here's the other side of that. Once once your brand is so big national, you don't have the black market. No, they, they won't you at all. You have outlets for things. You don't exactly. have a fucking issue. The interstate commerce is not a fucking issue at that point. No. And that's the biggest thorn in your ass is interstate Banking, commerce loss. Investment, loans, yeah. fucking taxation yeah. changes. Right now, if yeah. you're in cannabis, you're getting fucking buried alive. And, but it's, it's what you have to go through. And so like, you know, when I saw this yeah. taking place for me, I went after real estate and licenses and, and people around me were like, they were, they were angry. Cause they were like, you know, you're fucking greedy. And I said, no, I'm not greedy. I don't know what's going to work. And so I need to get everything I can get because I know that some of them are not going to work. Mm -hmm. And I don't know which ones are going to go and which ones aren't. Yeah. And it's really the truth. I mean, you've never had to work so hard for unknown results, but it's what it is. And and for me, you know, here is where I like to be. And if this is what's required, this is what the fuck I got to do. 
because I ain't going anywhere. Hundred yeah. percent. Like we yeah. said before, it's the only the only thing we know how to do. So yeah, the only thing I want to fucking do. Like I I've been doing it for so long that I I'm like you know what I'm happy here. What yeah. advice do you have as somebody who's come from the traditional market and now operating in uh, the legal market? you know, what is something that you wish you had learned earlier or advice that you give to individuals similar to yourself that are undergoing the same process today? Oh shit. I gave, I gave, I gave people in big companies too much credit. I thought that, that really heavily funded companies approached projects radically differently. I thought they came at it with this incredible fucking level of discretion and, and, and beautiful choices. Now what they do is they throw money at it till it fucking sticks it's a disaster when you see behind the fucking frame, right? So if you're coming from the traditional forward, man, have no fucking fear other than capitalization. You need to have enough money to fight. But if you can survive in the game, you're going to survive just fine in this fucking game. You're not, you're not lacking ability. You're lacking ability to, to source cash. Cash is what you, what you don't have. And that's really the key difference is your mind is accurate and your experiences are accurate. But you need to understand how much money you're going to have to have to fight a protracted war to get the result. Yeah. And if I had known quicker, I would have went at it even more aggressively. I would have been smashing on motherfuckers. Do you? Because, sorry, go ahead. Oh, it's just because you you come from where we come from, a traditional. We give credit to all the people that are from the norm because in our minds that's elevated. And once you get into it, you realize, oh, my God, this is no. this is shit you learned in a book. We're better than them. We 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 learned on our feet. Well, we like we can, used both eyes because we had ripoffs that were coming to get us, and we had the cops that were coming to get us. So we had double intuition, and and had to hone that double intuition all the time. So it was just a different sort of, you know, mm -hmm. those dudes just had to get through the fucking frat, man. They just yeah, had yeah. to survive <laughs> the next frat party and graduate, bro. And then they got thrown into the pipeline and manage someone else's fucking money and do whatever. And it's like. You know, hey, that's fine. But but I love the fact that when I do link arms with with guys in the industry that are at that same level, they're fucking mavericks, motherfucking yeah, mavericks, man. Fucking like, like what I love about it too is that there are a bunch of guys who were so good at gaming a system that they weren't they they you couldn't control them. So when you put a system in front of them, like the cannabis industry, like metric, like anything else. You're still not going to control them. You know, they're going to fucking survive. And I love that about it, that it's like, man, it, it, it's such a beautiful thing to see. Like, there's nothing like this industry. That's why I think it's going to be bigger than oil. It's mm -hmm. going to be bigger than anything. It's going to take over pharmaceutical. It's going to be one of the biggest fucking industries. And and what's great about it is that some of us will be there. And it's not like the Bruce Perlowen or the fucking, you know what I mean? Like these, these other guys that kind of just, I, I felt like, bastardized what we were trying to do and what was happening at the time so it's you know it's it's cool to see this now it really is and it's and it's kind of like um it, it, i wonder myself you know i'm sure jameson does too about like you know what is what is like next for you what do you got that's kind of your 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 um i mean gongier you know you got all these other things that you're doing but what is your sort of like magnus opus you think what will it be i think gosh you know i think i really think that the the, the the Magnus Opus has been in play for a long time. It's that I dreamt of I dreamt of spending my life in cannabis and being a good link in a chain. I had this revelation on the hill one day when I come out of it when I used to run diesel ops, and I remember I come out of one of the ops and I was chilling on the hill and and in my mind I had, I was in fucking Afghanistan and I, I I had like gone back in time and I realized that. I was a cultivator like all cultivators and that I, I was just a link in a chain. And I, I just had this vision that I just wanted to be a good link. And, and soldier. I, that's what I, <laughs> that's what I still want now is that, is that if I could just do that, if I could, if I could just be a good link in the chain of continuity cultivators before me, with me and after me, then I did everything I could have dreamt of. And, and that's enough because I never had any of these ambitions. I, I just wanted to be able to get a good life. And for me, good life was, you know, basically good friends, enough money, uh, a good woman 
and I was cool. I didn't have yeah. any ambition other than that because I, I already saw what life looked like pretty clearly when I was young. And I realized that a lot of the shit that people wanted really didn't matter to me. What, what I wanted was just the quality of life. I wanted the day to day to be good and cannabis mm -hmm. provided that. And so for me, what I wanted to do was share that ability with people all these years was to like empower them with like, if you took this clone and this fucking formula that I'm giving you and took this advice, you could change your life. And it worked for a lot of people. And I, as, a, as an older guy, I look back and I go, wow, I got to be involved in some really, really rich shit. And yeah. I never expected it. And I'm just grateful because it meant that my life had a, a, a greater impact than I expected. And it just makes you feel happy to be a human being. You know, it's like the simplest shit. Everybody wants to be fucking king. And I'm like, it's a lot of work. I'd rather be the king's fucking little brother. <laughs> yeah. Do you, do you think, do you think that you would love this as much if it didn't have the money in it? Oh, fuck yeah. Because I'm still in it right now and I'm fucking bleeding cash. So, <laughs> so all my money went away years ago and because I sunk it into so many operations, I'm just waiting to recover that next wave when it happens. But really I've never probably been so poor as an adult. As I am but, right but, now, but, but only I, so much shit. Like that's but what I mean is this: like be, before <laughs> all that came, I think what attracted all of us into cannabis is that we figured out, like, oh, I can, I can get some fronted to me, and I could turn it into joints, and I can sell it, and I can make a profit, and I can go get more, and I can keep repeating that process until I learn how to grow it, and then I can produce it myself and have some guys that do that mm -hmm. process, but I do, and we all learn that, right? And I always wonder to myself is like if that profitability wasn't in cannabis, would I be so in love with it? You know, if, if it were just like a coffee in my life and, and it was in the morning I made it and I drank it and it made me go, would it still be, would I still love it as much? So I think that's Ooh, a great question. I wonder. I love that morning cup though. I tell you right now, like I, I grind certain <laughs> fucking coffee. Oh, like I fucking up the, pour over. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I, I like the coffee too like that. I think I would still love it in, in a way. It's just that because it was a business, you immersed yourself in it so fully. Yeah. So what it did is it gave you 10, 12 hours a day of fucking with it. And and for me, you know, they always talk about making your hobby your business. So you're, you know, you're able to, you know, make money off of what you love. And again, it just happened yeah. to be that thing. But what I know is that. I get asked for years now, you know, what are you going to do when you retire? What's next? And I said, there is no fucking next. There's no next. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I know is that the, the love for the craft never left. And I know that because we're still in the struggle and like for all of us in the game, anybody telling you they're making money right now, I like to see it. Yeah. You're, 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 I'm making progress like a motherfucker, but it's not in fucking foldable paper. Yeah. And well, hardware, hardware, uh, supply stuff. I mean, it, it's, th that's it's kind of what's directed me in a certain direction is I'm like, well, how, how, just like with the lab, we were growers and we said, how the fuck do we be less vulnerable and still be a part of this industry? Mm -hmm. Oh, let's be the first cannabis testing lab. Same idea now is like, how do I survive as a business in this industry? Cause I don't want to leave and be able to be profitable. And what that comes down to, what I see now as profitability in this industry is looking at the supply chain, looking at these other components, because there's still always going to be growth in the industry. Oh, totally. But how does it move around? How does it do this? Build your business in those places, because mm -hmm. that's where the, ne the next two years growth is going to be. And that growth itself is going to be the infrastructure that that massive explosion is going to fucking land off of. Completely. And that's kind of how I see it, too. So it's... No, it's, 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 uh, what a fucking pleasure getting to talk to you. This has been great. Yeah, no, it's been a great time, man. We, yeah, cause you really and I, we, we chatted once or twice briefly, but this is our first time really fucking hanging out. Where, where are you at physically? I'm down in Los Angeles. I'm in San Pedro at the beach. So. Gotcha. Nice. Yeah. Cause I seen you, I seen you down there doing some morning workouts. A little bit of that shit. Yeah. Yeah. Some no, cause I do the same thing, man. I'm a fucking health freak too. Otherwise you, 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 you got to take care of yourself or you're a fucking wreck. And for men, once men, like, what I noticed is that when I watch hunting shows and NASCAR shit, it's, it's all the shows that have all the dick medication ads. And I said, that's telling. You should be really fucking aware that if you're watching a lot of that, they know that your shit don't work. And so what I know yeah. is that when fucking dudes start to lose their physicality, they get weird. Yeah. And I just a, noticed that. Like a, like a raccoon in a dumpster, you know? Yes. <laughs> they become strange.
Kev, I want to ask you about your thoughts on novel cannabinoids, minors. Do you feel as though they're going to have a play in the recreational market over the next five years? Or do you feel that that's, uh, it, it's, it's probably not going to be adapted by large scale rec consumers? Oh, no, it'll, it'll, it'll most definitely be adapted because what they're going to do is they're going to locate cannabinoids. They're going to have some interesting fucking impact. So it's just like, you know, when you identify which, which cannabinoids are involved with what we would call longevity of the high. So all of a sudden, you know, you start, you start being able to locate those cannabinoids. You mark them on the chromosome. You select the breeding to go that direction. And what you have is herb that keeps you high for four fucking hours. That, that it's coming. And, and I think that you'll see it. The, the medical, the thing is recreation and medical are going to go to war again over who's controlling what because of what the value is. And so you, you don't have medical to the degree that you really do. Right now we have this research medical, but the day these fucking guys can get insurance to pay for cannabis, holy fuck, now you got to know the problem. That's going to be an interesting war over who controls the fucking genome then. Who's can they do that in Canada, Jameson? Uh, yes, they can do that in Canada. Not up to a hundred percent, but in uh, in Germany they can up to a hundred percent. And so, in early days of legalization, they were charging like twenty eight to thirty two euro a gram, and it was nobody, no, no patients cared because it was fully covered. So yeah, yeah. it didn't matter. Nope. Um, and that that was all Bedrican, right? Yes. That was Bedrocan and that and, and, and the the yeah, the pharmacies made out like bandits and, and in Canada there's there's also opportunity to do that where you can have um, partial coverage, but it's very few insurance providers and um, oh, you know, it only extenuating circumstances, but re realistically it's drug identification numbers. Like once you can get to a drug identification number then you can get to something that can be prescribed and that can be written off very easily. You know what it is? I want to sell weed to Kaiser and then I can die. I'll be happy. If you get that Kaiser money, oh. you know, at that point you're fucking like, I mean, you're probably like chopping off goat's heads and drinking baby blood. <laughs> at that point. Like, yeah, the pentagram tattoos are coming out. There's got it. Yep. They're fucking fucking Illuminati no on your forehead. and fucking get closed like, uh, once you get Kaiser money. Once you're touching all the over. fucking demon shit comes out. But yeah, it's, yeah, like all it's gonna be a, a widely adopted um thing where it's it's no longer just THC. This is my THC and THCV blend with that's OG it's OG THC and THCV instead of just OG Kush. Like wh wh where do you see it going in the immediate? Oh, shit. Well, at first, it'll be novel cannabinoids that they'll bring forward that they say this has this and you'll see people want it because it's new, new. But what mm -hmm. I see taking place is, is as we start to go forward, why wouldn't you do just like you're having this renaissance in breeding for hash? Why wouldn't you start to have a renaissance in breeding for tailored cannabinoids? Because once they get the testing standard, you'd be able to use your own home testing devices uh, at, at location to be able to start to steer and you'll start to see these unique blends that have come out and then those would be proprietary that would be patented that would be able to be you know worked through and then licensed through nft so that i'd be able to access so mm -hmm. addison breeds something that's incredible he puts it into into a, a situation where i can buy an nft to access it through blockchain he gets paid when i use it in my project yeah. so now it lets me tap into the genes and start to weave his cool gene pool into what i'm working with it, once the contracts are here, it's about to go down. The next couple wow. of years are going to be fucking nuts because the scientists are going to start releasing material into the system. Breeders will start releasing material in the system that you'll be able to license to use in your projects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I'm digging. Yeah. I'd love I'd love to, I can't wait to see it because it's everything we've seen now. I mean, I'm, I'm from the, the brick herb of the past wasn't bad. Some of it was absolutely incredible and the hash was unreal. But oh, then yeah. we indoor the first indoor starts to come out and i'm amazed and then i get my first real outdoor in hawaii where i was like blown the fuck away and that would have been in the 80s and then i'm in california in the 80s and the, the outdoor is phenomenal and then and here we are now with with you know cold room rosin 
Can mm-hmm. you imagine if you broke out cold room rosin back in fucking 82? Oh, you would have been like fucking like M- Marty McFly, bro. It would have been yeah, yeah. Crazy. No one's ever anything like it in their life. The, the <laughs> yeah. mouth all of that. Kev, what's your experience with shade grown cannabis? Like I was, I've been talking to uh, T. Beasel from Little Lake Valley and um, and and a, and and a number of other individuals who have, have experienced better yields and better quality in resin when grown in less light intensity. Is that something that you ever experienced during yeah. the days when you were cultivating oh. sort of gorilla in the in the in, in the forest, today. countries? And today, yeah, anything that's broadleaf, anything that's broadleaf really does better with the nap and does better with kind of like diffused light. And and it's because really the angle of inclination that the, the plants were developed from were meant to not have such high light intensity. What, what doesn't like diffused light or reduced light is anything equatorial. So if that shit's genes were programmed to function under zero latitude, it still wants fucking that much sun. But what I noticed is stuff like like cookies is a good example. The cookies cut shines when it loses light during the end of the day. It just finishes better. And stuff like sour, sour does better when the light drops. It tightens up a little. You don't get the same bolting. But it it just, it me and me and a breeder were talking about it. And he was talking about what he was developing. And I said, you ought to start breeding stuff for like shit conditions. And he's like, why would I do that? And I said, that's where most people really grow. Very few people are putting their stuff out in full awesome sun. But a lot of it is just really genetic predisposition of the plant. Like, what was it programmed to do? And what we know is that plants reach a, like a photosynthetic peak, and then they take a kind of nap in terms of efficiency. Then they turn back on again the latter part of the day. Then they coast out with the sunset. So a lot of that is about efficiency. So if you could replicate it indoor, it would allow you to be able to have these curves that would allow you to drop intensity when the plant couldn't really up- accept the light. And then re-ramp it back up so that you were as efficient as possible with with usage. With outdoor, it just comes to where you locate and what you use. And I just think that um, a lot of it is that we don't get to run the same stuff long enough at a location to really optimize because we're trying to always chase what the market wants. And I think what you'll really be able to get is some really solid information once people start to say, okay, this is really good pot. It's going to be good pot. OG Kush was good in 91. It's still good in fucking 2022. Mm -hmm. So if you had grown OG from 91 to now, you were never really out of fucking fashion. Good is fucking good. And that's what people don't catch is that when you're chasing trendy shit, that's great. But is it timeless? Would you consume it fucking next year too? And whenever I say that about something, I'm like, oh, that's just good. That would be good now and, and in the future. It might be superseded by something, but it doesn't make that it's not good. No. It's still a fucking- It has a place. Yeah. It's still good. You know, like- What you got to do is you got to focus on your identity and that good so that you know how to optimize what you're doing and you're able to use your farm to the best situation. Mm-hmm. Well, know, know your lane. Figure out yep. what you got. You know, know what be you're cool good at that. too. And, and be like cool. You, you, like when you were telling your story- and you were talking about how the hash the hash thing fell out for you. You pivoted and you went into clones. Mm-hmm. That's it's the same thing. It's like I tell people all the time. It's like, oh, how do you, man? How how do I do this or that? I'm like, survive. Yeah, Just you figure, figure out how to survive. I, I'm not you. I can't look and see what's in front of me and on the next tool I'm going to use to survive with. But fucking survive. That's mm-hmm. how you do it. You know. And then and then you figure out like, oh shit. Oh well, then I have this brain, and if I don't, and if I'm, I'm my own worst enemy, and I don't overreact about shit and don't work myself up over things, I have a lot more control over the rest of what's going on. Oh, I can control my emotions now. I can control my fucking money, and they start to figure these things out. And oh, my health, and and you know, then you get better and better. That's kind of the evolution of it, right? So, Truth, man. Hopefully, development. Hopefully, and and what you, what I learned too is that like I, I remember a point in time where I said, I, I'm successful. And it will be like this fucking forever. And what you realize is that until you die, that shit's not true. That it's it's up and fucking down the whole time. And that you have to really start to explain what success is at each one of those moments so that you're able to keep yourself on a track. And where are we at? And so like, that's why we all laugh right now is that someone's like, you're killing. And I'm like, no, I'm killing inequity. I got fucking shit going on globally. But, um, 
day to day? No, I'm fucking poor. And so I have to make sure that I know that's not how I'm valuing myself right now. I'm valuing yeah. myself on all the work I'm doing, building and creating to get to the next piece, which is just like we did at, at all these stages in our lives where we come in, we work really hard and all of a sudden opportunity kicks in and you blow the fuck up and you ride the wave and accept that You know, when you get older, you know that the wave is going to crash. When you're young, you think you're going to surf that motherfucker forever. Forever. It never, yeah. it never turns over. You're just in the barrel for life. <laughs> just fucking. Oh. The innocence. oh, the fucking innocence, man. I'm so glad I got to experience it because those moments where you were just on fire in love with yourself, you were hugging yourself every day. Mm. <laughs> man. The, lo the losses to stack up. Like, oh. like now, nowadays, it's like a loss might piss you off for a couple of minutes, but then you're like, all right, I can write that off at least. And I can. That's what it is. I'm going to have some effect here or whatever. It's like. Fuck, it means man. that you're trying. If you don't have some failures, you're not getting enough effort out because you're 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 just not putting the work in. And so I yeah. just know that if I if I just put pressure on it constantly, I should make movement. And if I'm not afraid to fail, then you'll fail quick. It won't take years to find out. And you just have to be honest about it and and don't allow the the, the world to judge what you do because otherwise you'll never make a decision on your own. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I'm not really asking. How much time we got? Where, Kev? Where's the Where's the best place for people to reach you, bro? Oh shit, man! Um, you can catch me. I'm just Kevin Jodry everywhere. I'm Kevin Jodry on LinkedIn. I'm Kevin Jodry on Facebook. I'm Kevin Jodry on fucking IG. And and then I I fuck around with you and and um Big Josh. So we got man. we got some shit going on. And uh, if anybody's up in Humboldt County or something, man, just fucking hit me up and come say hi. Beautiful. Fuck yeah. I'm a Brother, it was yeah. a great day, man. Thank you. Appreciate Wonderful you time. time man. Good to chop it up with you, brother. Thank you so much, brother. Appreciate you Thank guys. Thank you, Kevin. Appreciate it, man. Awesome. Later, guys. Cheers, everyone. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Cheers.